We're going to call tonight's meeting to order. Can we start with a roll call? Council Member Story? Here. Council Member Brooks? Here. Council Member Bottorf? Here. And Mayor Peterson? Here. Uh, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance. allegiance. All right. Tonight's meeting is Cablecast Live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 75, uh, excuse me, 25. Meetings can also be viewed live from our city's website, cityofcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Ben Thompson. Thank you for being here, Ben. As a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. Um, and if you come for public comment, please sign your name on the sheet at the podium to confirm uh, spelling for the record. We're going to move on. Item two is presentations. We have an update from Santa Cruz Metro. Metro RTC team 
uh, has been studying that corridor and has been meeting with various focus groups and held public hearings uh, throughout the county to obtain input and uh, feedback. On the goals. Ah, there you go. Next year. There we go. All yeah. right. No. Oh, I missed the first part, please. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hey. All right. So back on the Unified Corridor, uh, Metro team and RTC team are working together uh, throughout uh, meeting with focus groups throughout the county and holding public hearings to solicit feedback on the kinds of performance measures and metrics that should be used to evaluate the transit options in that rail corridor. And I know you follow that closely. As you know, that corridor runs from Watsonville, Pajaro, all the way into Santa Cruz. Um, last week, the team met with the Planning and Public Works uh, staff from the various cities. And then what is happening is the culmination of this process uh, will bring to, will come together with uh, the RTC staff making a recommendation to the commission on the preferred alternative targeting January of 2021. So that, that one's getting a little bit closer, too. Um, you may have followed us uh, on the bus on shoulder discussion. We're continuing to advance the environmental clearance for the bus on shoulder in coordination and actually in collaboration with our lead partner agency, the RTC. We're excited about that and uh, if that environmental clearance process goes well, then they'll integrate the bus on shoulder into the auxiliary lanes and eventually that will help to speed up our bus service between Watsonville, Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz, and Watsonville. So we're really excited about having a bus move while everybody else is stopped in gridlock. We think that'll be a good marketing uh, and hopefully attract a lot of people to the, the, the service. Uh, you no doubt have been following your own Capitola Mall and what's going on there, as we have. Um, our staff has met uh, with the uh, uh, developer, Merlon Geyer, in November of 2019. Uh, to discuss the relocation of the transit facility uh, it, there and uh, the discussions continue to be ongoing and um, sorry we've also coordinated with them on the relocation of that transit facility from sort of the 41st Street uh, Avenue uh, frontage over to an area by Macy's and Coles in which we would access off of Claire's so that's ongoing discussions about how to do that and then we're also talking about the possibility of additional stops on 41st and Capitola um, with the potential of 600, maybe more units going in there. We think it's a great opportunity to capture more ridership. And um, um, especially if you consider the fact that we have five different routes that go through the Capitola Mall Transit Center, it's pretty exciting for us. Um, also, Metro staff has met with the City of Capitola Public Works to discuss the city traffic signal synchronization project on 41st, as well as, as to for us to try to understand um, how that will affect traffic circulation and especially with the mall uh, redevelopment and the transit center relocation. So as you can tell, a lot going on between Metro and Capitola over the last year and a lot of really good things happening with Metro. Um, watch for those buses. That is just going to be exciting to launch zero emission fully electric buses. What a great thing. With that, I'm I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Yes, yeah. Council Member Story. Uh, thank you, Alex, for coming and giving us that annual report. Um, I was excited to hear about the bus on shoulders. Yes. Uh, what time frame? When do you think that that may actually be um, hitting the shoulders? If you promise not to hold me to it, we're but looking, we, we won't, looking but at about a two-year time frame to get two that, years to out. Get that. Okay. And, and hopefully that will be all the way from the existing auxiliary lane to 41st. Excellent. Okay. And, and I don't know if you noticed um, what we're doing. It's a, it's a little bit of a different sort of hybrid bus on shoulder. That bus will operate in the auxiliary lane, and then when it gets to an overpass, for example, there'll be a patch of asphalt for us to continue on through uh, and then on to the next part of the auxiliary lane. So that's okay. how this one's being structured. So that would be continuous. And yes. maybe just one follow-up. I'm curious, um, how will you keep other people from using that lane or getting in? getting in your way we yeah. won't by, by design that auxiliary lane is general public use right um, but if all goes well that auxiliary lane will keep moving or move at a faster pace than right. traffic in the mixed flow lanes and we'll just okay. continue to go on through we're not looking to, to to speed through there just to move at a better pace than the traffic in the mixed flow lanes certainly yes thank you thank you, thank you.
Any other questions? Questions? No. Thank you so much. Thank you too. I'll see you Thanks, again next Alex. year. Take care. All right, we're moving on to item three, a report on closed session. Can I say something about the report? Um, when we, we're going to be coming to uh, public comments in just a couple items, and then this you'll be welcome to come speak. The metro. This is specific to his report. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to refer to the city attorney. My understanding is we need to wait till the public comment section, correct? That's right. This isn't an item on the agenda, but you'll have a chance to speak in just a bit. And you can speak My about this item. My understanding is any item on the agenda people uh, are uh, allowed to comment on. And you can, uh, this presentation is an item. You can comment during public comment. We, we aren't at that portion of the meeting yet, but we'll be there probably well, pretty quickly. Well, this is about the Metro. You can comment about the Metro during public comment. Why not? I don't understand. This is presentation now. It's an agenda item now. I'm a regular bus rider. We would be happy to hear your comments about it during the public comment section. Well, I heard you repeat that, but this was uh, unusual procedure. This means we have a specific agenda item. All right, we're going to move on to item three, report on closed session. Direction was given to staff on the first item, the conference with the labor negotiator um, on the anticipated litigation. Uh, direction was given to staff. There is one item on the agenda, on the open session agenda related to one of those items. And direction was given to staff on the liability claim. That item is also on the agenda. Great, thank you. Uh, item four, any additional materials? Yes, we have three items. Um, one for item 10A and two for item 10B. There are copies um, on the dais and at the back as well. Great, thank you. Uh, any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? No additions? Staff has no changes. Thank you. Okay, now we're on to public comment. So now is the time for any member of the public to address the council. Uh, on any item not on tonight's agenda. Uh, your presentations will be limited to three minutes per speaker. Uh, we do ask that you sign your name at the podium if you would like it spelled correctly for the minutes. Are there any members of the public that would like to address the council? Um. If you were to say people address during the public comment all the items on the agenda, then it would be clear. I believe you are in error on this, but I will Ma'am, we're going to ask that you address the, the council directly during public comment. I am comment. addressing everyone who can hear me, everyone. Um, I received, as a bus driver, writer, it's very uncomfortable for me with all the cell phone use on the bus, all the Wi-Fi, and that the uh, Metro is promoting a carcinogenic uh, device. Uh, the World Health, Cor uh, Health Organization labels wireless radiation in the same category of carcinogen as lead in DDT. And just because it's popular, doesn't mean it's safe. I'm so old, I remember when people were smoking everywhere over the food and the markets and it was just acceptable. This is worse. It is more toxic, it's more insidious, and it's very disturbing that common sense and corporate propaganda uh, seems to prevail over common sense. And I find it uh, uh, not um, appropriate for what public entities should be doing to protect the public. I received last week a copy of a, an article from Arthur Furstenberg of Cell Phone Task Force, and he's with 5gspaceappeal.org. The article's titled The Honey Bees plea and cites how when 5G was installed in Australia and this beautiful garden, he has quotes from a woman who had heritage trees, 
lots of bees and flowers two months after the 5G microwave technology phased array went in. All the insects are gone. None are there. She dug into the earth. No earthworms. This is an existential threat the 5G and it's an intensification of the damage that has already occurred from wireless radiation technology since the Telecom Act of 1996. Everything needs to be done to stop this. I will give you uh, copies of the article and urge you to sign on to the 5G uh, appeal. and. Um, very, very disturbing that local officials are promoting harm, known damage. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Hello, thank you. Good evening. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm running for county supervisor in the second district, and it's a real pleasure to be here before your council tonight. Um, there are some things I do want to discuss with you and your audience. Um, I very much appreciated the presentation about the Metro. And um, one question I would like to ask, having come from now two successive um, public outreach open houses with the Regional Transportation Commission about the um, transit corridor alternatives analysis for the rail corridor. Um, a friend of mine has uh, told me that you can get a conversion for existing buses. Uh, it's called, a, you turn them into a high rail bus, and each conversion costs about $10,000. So um, that's one suggestion I made for the uh, alternatives analysis is to use existing metro buses with this retrofit that is comparatively affordable. And um, I'm I'm really interested in hearing how Metro will interact with the rail corridor plans when whatever is decided comes out. A uh, comment must be submitted on that uh, scoping session by tonight, I, I believe at midnight. Today is the last day. Um, I'm also excited that a hydrogen fuel cell passenger train is coming to our county. It's been postponed to October. But again, uh, at the uh, Live Oak meeting, which was incredibly well attended, maybe you were there, I just couldn't see you, there were so many people, but I did have the good fortune of meeting um, the man who is promoting the hydrogen fuel cell trains and asked him where the route would be. Um, he said that they're, they're hoping, and probably you know this, but it was news to me that it would uh, be on the Santa Cruz side of the, the Capitola Trestle. I would like to ask that your group try to uh, encourage that spot to be moved a little bit more uh, closer to the Jade Street Park. I think that will be a better gathering place for it and uh, better parking. I also want to commend you on your um, Government Academy. I found it on your website quite by accident, but what a treat to have um, a, a city government really working hard to help people understand government not only city government, but it, how it interacts with the county. So thank you for doing that. I wanted to observe, but I was not allowed. I was told members of the public would mess it up. But I really want to commend you for, for doing that. And lastly, I want to uh, just say that um, I have been observing a uh, cell tower on at 200 Kennedy Drive, it's within the city limits, that has been, within the last year, very much extended and expanded. And I was a little concerned to hear that there is no program for monitoring the EMFs at cell sites in the city. And this is now due to get even more uh, antennas. So I would like to encourage you to do some monitoring and make sure that Thank you. those living it. and working near are not harmed. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Isaac Gonzalez, and I'm a parent of a student in SoCal Union Elementary School District. And I'm here this evening to briefly talk about Measure V that I'm sure you've heard of. Um, Measure V is on the ballot, which is coming up in March, which is a very exciting ballot, and I assume we're going to have a lot of voter turnout. 
And I just wanna ensure that it's not lost. Um, it's extremely important that we gather extra funding for our schools and it's um, vital to our community, which we're all a part of. This Saturday, we're going to have a precinct walk at 10 a.m. in the Monterey Park. And the more our community knows about Measure V and what it's for to support our teachers and our programs <coughs> in the schools that our students and family members go to, the better, because last time um, we lost by a horrifically tiny, tiny amount of votes. So when I say every vote counts, I mean every vote, even 54 votes counts. Um, and if you have any questions about it, um, as a community member, I'd be more than happy to answer them. And just thank you so much for your time tonight. And I'll put my name down here. Thank you. Right, thanks. Is there any other member of the public that would like to address the council this evening? Hello, welcome. Hi there, my name is Gabrielle DeMariano and I'm here on behalf of Deante's Community Dental Care. Um, and the reason I am here is because of the uh, Capitola Community Grants Program that's going to be discussed. And um, I just wanted to thank, on behalf of Deante's, the city of Capitola and the leaders of the Capitola Community Grants Program um, for all of their support over Excuse these. Excuse me, this is so, I am oh. not on your agenda. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> We're almost there. Thank you. Uh, is there any other member of the public that would like to address the council? On items not on tonight's agenda. Seeing none, we will move on. Uh, city council and staff comments. Does staff have any comments? I don't think we do this evening. Nope. All right. Uh, council comments. Any comments on this side? None. No. Any My comments? Apologies for missing the closed session. Thank you. No, no worries. We're glad you made it. I'm glad you're here. Comments? Yes. Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah. Um, I just have a couple comments. The first is to acknowledge um, the city of Capitola. We, we received an email from the County of Santa Cruz's health uh, department letting us know that because we've created an ordinance or a ban prohibiting flavored tobacco, our letter grade went from a D to a B plus. Um, so that was just really good news um, just with that small that small thing we, we did, well, I don't think it's small, but. And then today I, attend, I attended the CJC, the Community Justice Committee, and learned about two grant opportunities um, that our city can possibly be eligible for that I'd like staff to look into a little bit further. One is, um, that was released today, it's a Prop 64 grant, and that's um, funds for the, um, outreach to communities to community members and schools regarding cannabis and then the other one was released by the doj as a grant for um just more outreach for vaping so those are two things that i, I believe our city can um, apply for so thank you thank you any further council comments i do yes okay i'm sorry a little out of sorts here so um Let's see, I heard you speak at the uh, strategic plan update for the uh, COE, and you were great. Oh, thanks. So um, that was a, a great, great event uh, down at the Maw, and it was, um, you know, very um, informative to me about what our county office of education is uh, planning and doing. And I know it's a bunch of students here, and county office of education has a lot to do with many of the programs that you are involved in, uh, but not directly. So if you're interested, go to the website and you'll find out some of the things that the county offers. Um, the other thing on the RTC, um, I forgot <laughs> to mention this when our Metro person was here, but the RTC recently made a decision to extend the um, bus on shoulder program, but it's in an, R, um, it's in an evaluation phase right now. And this would extend it uh, considerably past 41st, uh, Park Avenue, et cetera, down to Freedom. And the beauty of this is that it will make a unified system starting uh, at the Strangler, <laughs> we call it the Opsa Strangler and the Freedom Boulevard area, all the way up. And so this is evaluation right now. It is a departure from Measure D. And the reason why I'm bringing it up right now is because it's a departure from Measure D, 
I'm going to ask that we put it on the agenda and have a, a staff person from the RTC come here and explain the rationale why this is a benefit to the county of, Capito uh, county of Santa Cruz and in particular to Capitola, actually. So I'd like to have that added to the agenda. I feel it's important because it wasn't in Measure D. We made a finding at the last RTC meeting. Ed was not there, but I remember this discussion. A lot of the public took exception to it, but I think it's important for us to get back to the public to explain why this measure was um, extended. Thank you very much. Yes, Question please. clarification. Would, would we be better to have a presentation rather than put it on the agenda? I would like, yes, I would like a presentation. Yes, okay. thanks for the clarification. Okay. Yes, yeah, just as we just had from Metro, um, I, I think in general pe people will agree that a unified system going from as close as we can to Watsonville all the way up to Santa Cruz is a benefit, a unified system. Just having bus on shoulder for a certain segment in a way doesn't make sense because there's a whole rest of Highway 1 that needs to be connected to that. So this is a study phase right now, and if it passes the study phase, I think we'll find a way to make it funded. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, if there's no further uh, council comments, we will move on to item eight, boards, commissions, and committee appointments. Uh, council member uh, Bertrand, you have uh, an appointment to make the finance advisory committee. Um, I'd like to make a public statement here. Um, this time we had three highly qualified people apply for this position. Um, and it was a very difficult one for me to make a choice. Um, I met with each person. Um, I asked each person to, uh, well, one has been on the committee, but the ones that haven't been on the committee, I asked them to meet with Jim, which I felt was very appropriate because Jim is our finance director. Um, my apology actually is to each one of the candidates because I've had a recent family emergency that's been taking up my time for almost over a week now. And I've missed everything here in Capitola and in Santa Cruz and been mostly up in San Francisco in the hospital. So I was not able to talk to the people I did not choose. And I really feel that as a major oversight. Capitola depends on volunteers. It depends on people in this community stepping forward and contributing. And so those who offered to contribute but weren't chosen, I wanted to explain to them directly. So some people may be surprised um, about my, about my per um, performance. I really think it was very poor on my part. But uh, my nomination is to Laura Aliota. And I don't know if she's here, but if she is, I would like to have her come up and introduce herself. She's on the Art and Cultural Committee right now. Um, I've had extensive conversation with you. I think your background is going to be well-fitting for this position. Hi. So I'm uh, Laura Aliotto, and I serve with Sam on the Art and Cultural Commission, which I've really enjoyed. And... Um, recently got to select the bands for the summer, which I'm really excited about. And so I am also um, attending the um, Academy for the City Government, and I found that also um, very interesting, being in the neighborhood for over 20 years, just learning more and kind of seeing my town through um, different eyes. So I put in my application for the Financial Advisory Board, and I work for an accounting firm mostly in taxation, and I had um, an enjoyable conversation with Shock as well as Jim, so I look forward to um, participating in a new area of the city. Thank you for accepting this position. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's a question. Sure. A uh, question? Do we need, will she be staying on both arts and cultural and, and finance now, or do we need a backfill art and cultural? The position. They can serve both. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's not are you going to stay on both? Position. Is she? Are you, is she going to stay on both? Shock. Um, she's not my appointment to that, but. Um. Laura. Are you willing to stay on both commission? Continue on both commissions. Yeah. Okay. Fabulous. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we took. We talked about that, and it didn't seem 
I mean, she's great. contributing in wonderful ways in the Art yeah. Commission also. That's great. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to item nine, consent calendar. Um, these are uh, items that will be enacted by one motion in the form as listed on the agenda. Um, there's no separate discussion unless members of the public or city council members uh, request specific items be uh, pulled for separate review. Is there any member of the public that would like to pull any of these items from consent agenda for separate discussion? Seeing none, is there any member of the council that would like to remove anything from consent for separate discussion? Seeing none, we will uh, entertain a motion. Motion to approve consent calendar. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We're going to move on to item 10, general government public hearings. Our first item, uh, 10A, community grant strategic plan. Um, and Ms. Yes. Madam Mayor, before you begin this item, um, I want to make an announcement that uh, um, the Community Action Board is a recipient of the community grants. Uh, my wife does good work with the Community Action Board, uh, but the price that I have to pay is that I have to recuse myself from this topic um, under the FPPC rules. So I'm going to leave the room. Thank you. Thank you. We're just waiting a minute for those wondering until uh, Council Member Story is, has <laughs> left the room. And we're back. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Peterson, uh, Council. Um, we're here to talk about the uh, review of the community grant program and um, uh, review of the program and review um, and the recommendations. And um, the city of Capitola uh, contracted with Optimum Solutions Consulting. And uh, we have uh, Nicole Lezen here to give the presentation on the results of that study. Great, thank you. Nicole? Good evening. I'm here representing Optimal Solutions Consulting and Nicole Young. It's a little confusing to have both Nicoles. <coughs> and I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm sorry, I'm struggling with my voice this week. Um, so I'm glad to have the amplification here. I'm going to go over some of the information from a report that we presented. The presentation tonight will follow the report that's also part of your packets that you've seen, and I will concentrate more on the options for the council to consider, but I'll go over our, our process and the information that we reviewed for you to, to have that as well. And in the interest of time, to also have some time for your questions. So as you know, uh, the city of Capitola contracted with Optimal Solutions Consulting to conduct this review of the community grant program. And we looked at the application process, the reporting process, how the awards were allocated, and also had a chance to talk to both uh, council members and some of the current grantees, and, t and also to people from s other small cities that are doing community grant uh, programs as well to see what we could learn from them. The um, activities that we reviewed are from the 2018-19 cycle, so it covers uh, $258,000 in grant funding that includes both the general fund and the, um, the children's fund, covering 31 agencies and 40 different programs. So a lot of scope uh, to cover. And as I mentioned, our process including, included interviews and reviewing materials, talking to people in other cities, and um, the, the presentation um, options that we'll go over here are based on, on these sorts of inputs. So I won't dwell on these, but some themes that you'll hear both in the report and in our presentation are that the community grant program is highly valued by recipients, 
Um, it does provide a mechanism for addressing community needs in partnership with community-based agencies and organizations, but there are questions about which needs and how, how those needs can be prioritized. There's also a fair amount of variation in how the applications are completed. So while the council has achieved a, a goal of simplifying and streamlining the application process that is very much appreciated by applicants, um, it does sometimes lead to some uh, variations in the information that you have available to you to evaluate and compare applications for, for funding. So based on all of these themes and the interviews and uh, document reviews that I mentioned earlier, we'll present some options to you for consideration. But first, we wanted to just give this overview of the funding allocations that we did look at. Oops, sorry. Try this instead. Well, maybe we won't. Can we get staff technical assistance? With the PowerPoint? There we go. Oh, there we go. We're good. Never mind. Spoke too soon. Thank the, you. Though. The magic of the escape button. <laughs> so the funding allocations, as you can see from this table, um, just making the point that the majority of the awards are for s relatively small amounts, and that becomes relevant in some of the information that I'll relay to you about the, the feedback that we got. So first, to start with the strong points, the strengths and benefits that were revealed to us in the interviews um, that we had both with council members and, and a sample of the grantees. As I mentioned earlier, um, the, the opportunity to address community needs through these grants so that, that health and well-being and quality of life in Capitola could be improved, and the idea of a partnership between the city and, and these organizations that are funded. The ease of the application process, was also mentioned by especially by grantees. And even the, the small grants, which are the majority of them, um, are highly valued, especially because the city, unlike some other places, did add a, a COLA increase to these grant funds. And the multi-year um, option for these grants was also highly valued since organizations only had to apply once for, for multiple years. So that helps with budgeting and also reduces the, the burden of applications. But along with any strengths and benefits, of course, there's always a flip side with some challenges and areas for improvement. So in terms of addressing community needs, we did hear both from some council members and some grantees that there was some uh, concern about funding not pr being particularly tied to a systematic assessment of community needs and priorities within those needs which made it difficult at times to answer questions about how this grant funding is actually improving the lives of Capitola residents and whether the grants were aligned with uh, a sense of high priority needs or gaps. In terms of the application process itself, while there was appreciation for the simplicity of the application process, which I, I know had, had was an effort that had been made in the last round, there was some concern that um, particularly by inviting prior grantees, there was uh, not as much room for inviting in new applicants or other kinds of ideas and innovation. There were some grantees that even though the process was streamlined, still had questions um, and needed clarification about both the application process and the reporting process. In our report, in more detail, we made some recommendations for some changes in wording that we thought might help clarify some of the, the requests for information. And one example of that is that there were some uh, questions about asking for the number of people served without context for that. So for example, there might be a smaller number of people served, but served with more high intensity um, services, and so that might be um, hard to compare to somebody who, to an agency that serves a lot of people with a, a lighter touch service. Not that one is better than the other, but just that the number alone doesn't necessarily convey that. We also uh, reviewed applications and reports and um, found that, again, not uncommonly, there was a lot, of, a lot more attention to um, outputs and methods rather than the results of, of the work or the outcomes of, of what the agencies are doing. 
And there were also considerable variations in how people interpreted the budget questions, particularly the proportion of funding as whether it was part of the overall organizational budget or a program budget, so what the denominator might be. Because of some of the variation that I've just mentioned, it was difficult to evaluate and compare applications one to another. And there were also some questions about the funding allocations to organizations that might generally be serving people outside of Capitola. There, um, there are probably some rationales for, for that kind of um, decision. For example, people who work here and live elsewhere or vice versa. But it just wasn't clear from the application questions and, and responses. We did hear some interest from council members about potentially changing the funding allocations and distributions. Um, there were also concerns about, with, as with any grant funding, competitive grant funding program, that larger organizations sometimes have a built-in edge because they have a uh, larger grant writing staff or more experience with grant writing. And there was some concern that that might um, edge out organizations that are smaller or don't have as much experience with applying for funding. And then there were also the children's fund allocations. There, was, uh, there were some questions about how that would work in the future if there were any of these changes made to the application process and to identifying priority needs. And some similar um, questions about reporting as applied to the application piece. So um, requests for some type of template or guidelines that would make that reporting a little more consistent. So based on all of that, and again, there's quite a bit more detail about this in our report, we presented um, three options for consideration, and you can see the middle option, option two, highlighted here. The first one is to maintain the status quo, so basically to leave the system of community grant programs as it is and not make any changes. That's definitely an option. It would have the advantage of not requiring additional um, resources or or causing um, <coughs> concern about any changes. On the other hand, it would leave some of the issues that were identified as challenges unaddressed. And another option is to eliminate the community grant program altogether. Um, the other small cities that we talked to as part of this process um, fi find this very challenging as well. Um, as one uh, city manager mentioned to us, we feel like we're acting as a philanthropy, but we don't have the staff and the resources to do that. So it is, it's relatively rare for small cities to take this on. So that's an option as well, or, or to have a different way of, of allocating the funding for longer term contracts, for example, which is what one city did. But we focused on this option of trying to take some incremental steps to improve the, the community grant program as it now stands over a period of one to two years. So I will go over some of the suggestions for what's included in that option. And it includes several incremental steps that increase in complexity, but also in benefit um, from, from what we heard, from what you were trying to get out of the co community grant program and continuing it. So I'll go over each of these, and then we'll have a chance to hear your questions. So the first option is um, the simplest, which is to revise the application process so that more uniform information can be obtained from applicants. And we have some specific suggestions in the report that go into a fair amount of detail about where exactly in the application process some changes could be made. But they include um, looking at the, the numbers of individual serves and the focus on Capitola residents in a more explicit way. Um, looking at the use of grant funds within the city of Capitola and focusing on different kinds of outcomes than, than just counting services or outputs. We also made some recommendations about clarifying the, the budget um, so that there would be some um, comparable, similar responses to the, in the application. And then potentially looking, um, asking more questions about how the proposed program or service matches a need which would require identifying some community needs, and we have some suggestions about that as well. A more complex step is to use a data-driven process or approach to identify and then prioritize needs for the city. So there are many options for using data, and fortunately, a lot of those have become much more accessible and will continue to, to do so. So we have um, 
the option, for example, of Data Share Santa Cruz, which was launched last year with support from the Community Foundation and the Health Services Agency for the county and the Health Improvement Partnership. And that's um, an, an option for obtaining data at s the census track level, and I'll have a couple of examples to show you. But that's just one example. So that can be, that can yield information by different age groups, on different aspects of community well-being that you see listed here, and other demographic um, characteristics or gaps, such as income levels or social isolation. This is very small on the screen, but there are larger versions in the report, and, and the, the four on the, um, on the left side are all captures from data share that are easily um, obtained with search parameters. So you can look at, for example, the percentage of people in Capitola paying more than a third of their income in, in rent uh, and compare that to both the county and to California overall. There are many, many indicators available that way. Um, and then there's another example there from, um, from an organization called Broad Street that does similar sorts of things, compiling data um, on standard indicators and comparing them to other places and to state trends. And you can also see whether the, your figures are going up or down in, in a particular trend line. So those are not, um, not difficult to obtain. So they're just some examples for you. Another step in, in option two, if you choose to pursue that, would be to, um, to use the data and, and the idea about prioritized needs to, um, to look and reassess the funding allocations in different ways. So there could be some way to uh, balance or redirect the funds among the existing grantees, to stagger funding cycles in such a way that new grantees could be um, incorporated over time. There are also options that we learned about in other cities for tiered funding models that would divide the funding that you have available into different categories. So there might be some smaller annual grants very similar to what you're doing now, and then a, a smaller number of larger grants that go for a particular um, issue. And those would be multi-year grants. There are always options, regardless of what you choose to do, as you're doing now, to have some separate allocations set aside for one-time sponsorships or of, of events or to, to track needs that are emerging and that weren't known at the time of the application process. And then all of these could be done in ways that apply some criteria to review and score the applications in a more systematic way. And some of the criteria that other places have used and that might be applicable um, to your own process are alignment with the needs that you've selected or prioritized, an organization's track record and, and prior or proposed contributions to making Capitola a better place to live, the specific service to Capitola's population or the city of Capitola, or addressing the needs of vulnerable populations or needs that are currently not being met, and leveraging funding in different ways because the amounts might be relatively small, so you'd want to know how they're being used in conjunction with other funds. And there are many ways to do this, but the organizations we looked at assigned different weights to these sorts of things and then scored the applications against these to arrive at a uh, ranking of the applicants. And then finally, um, there's if you pursue option two and identify needs and use a data-driven process and criteria, there are opportunities to align the city of Capitola's priorities with those of other entities in the county, including United Way, the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County, First Five. These are all organizations that are looking at different ways to align their funding more broadly. So it doesn't mean that there's a prescription of you can or can't fund certain ways, but just to try to get the idea that everybody's moving in the same direction or, or attacking uh, common problems that everyone is grappling with across the county. Sometimes that takes the form of co-investments, but more commonly it's the idea of we share this problem or need and we're going to try to address it in different ways together across the county. So that's why we recommended this middle option between maintaining the status quo or scrapping the community grant program um, altogether because we think it has potential to unlock a lot more opportunity 
um, both for grantees and for having results um, from this funding. And this is just a last summary of the steps that I've just described. So again, from the, the easiest to the more complicated. And I'd be happy to entertain any of your questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, are there any questions from council? Questions? Okay, let me gather my sure. questions. Questions? Anybody? Right. No? It's back to you then. Oh, geez. Sorry. <laughs> Don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm full of comments, not questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, have you seen other jurisdictions take on these steps based off of your recommendations? And what did that look like? Did they have staff come back and and were they able to successfully do that at the city level or did they have to branch out to organizations like yourselves? We saw a combination of using outsiders or doing things internally. The, the tiered funding model that was mentioned here is from the city of Hillsborough, Oregon and they did an internal process through their finance committee. Mm. Um, they had three people on a committee who I think looked at some other models and they've shared their materials with us and would be happy to share them with you as well. I'd love that, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and was there a reason that you, you combined both the children's fund and the grant dollars together since one is a dedicated fund funding model versus the other was there a reason you did that we were asked to look at them together so oh, okay. yeah it was part of our charge so gotcha. yeah. okay. but you're right one of them is set aside for that population but I, my understanding is that within that there weren't additional needs identified correct okay mm -hmm. um, that's all I have for now thank you all you're right. welcome. yes um, you made some comments about the benefit to Capitola as opposed to the benefit to the community at large. Um, how do you see that in terms of moving forward, that dichotomy between Capitola as an isolated entity or Capitola as part of a larger community and the programs that we support in a way are integrated in the larger community, not just focus on Capitola? We definitely see Capitola embedded in a larger community and all of these geographic jurisdictional borders are somewhat fluid. People move in and out for various reasons, um, both to, to live and to work. So some people move day to day and some people move in stages over a lifetime. And as a county, we, you know, we, we are all uh, together in, in this area and trying to make it better, but there are unique aspects of, of Capitola. Um, I think you heard earlier from the, the Metro discussion about there, there are things that pass through here or are unique to this, this physical location and yet they're profoundly affected by things surrounding us. So it's a hard question to answer without a, a specific um, example in front of us, but I, I think that there are ways to balance both of those things. The the uniqueness and, and the focus on this community, but also taking into account the, the larger context in which the city of Capitola is geographically, socially, economically embedded. So you talk about um, co-investing. I think you had a term. Mm -hmm. That's the term. So in a sense, that's a different level of criteria. It can be. How would yeah. you define that, or how would you look at that? So co-investing just can be each organization, let's say a, a foundation or a county agency. Um, in, in Hillsborough's case, they made a, a concerted effort for three years to address housing and homelessness. So all, a lot of different organizations are pooling their resource on that one issue that they see as most urgent right now, but they're not braiding their funding or pooling it in a formal way that's just they they call that co-investment we're all investing at the same time at any at different levels but on the same issue in different ways to try to make progress on it that so makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. but to some extent we're going to have to have a mechanism to come together on 
that effort absolutely or the investment effort and absolutely how would you see our program if it's option two or whatever option how would you see that going forward is there some um, prior examples um, you talk about Hillsborough but you didn't explain how they did that do you have a sense of how that could be done I do. Uh, Hillsborough did a process internally and they were moving towards that for some time, my understanding is over a period of years, because they didn't, th they didn't feel that the effort they were investing in doing a competitive process every year was, worth, was worthwhile, was getting them results and it was taking up a lot of time. Um, so there are many different ways to do that, but I think um, any of those options, whether you're co-investing with other jurisdictions or not, uh, requires some kind of further discussion internally about setting priorities and, and the criteria by which you might focus uh, grant funding. So if you take those steps in step two at some point, there's going to have to be some kind of um, discussion, prioritization, um, checking assumptions and rationales for what you all think is important. It doesn't mean it couldn't change over time, or it, and it might be more than one thing. Hillsboro happened to focus on one thing. But um, that's, that's a process that requires time and effort and discussion. Um, so a question so that's related, and city manager, maybe I should address this to you. Um, so I'm talking to one of the grantee one of our recipients um, it was made, um, made mention to me that we have some agreements that basically is a maintenance of effort agreement. So uh, for instance, with the RTC perhaps, um, where our money is helping the overall effort to succeed. Is, is this something that you could comment on? I mean, in a way, this is sort of like what she's talking about. We, we have these agreements already. I'm not aware of them, so this is something that I'm just sort of learning about. Well, I, I think the simplest answer is, is there's numerous items that we've co cooperated regionally to um, to do together with the other jurisdictions, whether it's regional transportation funding, um, obviously collaborate <clears throat> with Metro. We heard the presentation earlier from the Metro board about how we regionally provide uh, busing services. We do the same with libraries. We do the same with 911. So there's a lot of regional efforts that are done cooperatively with the other jurisdictions where we're all aligned and working together either directly together because we formed a new government agency or just in an aligned fashion. So I think the notion of sort of co-investment <coughs> could be done similarly, whether it's directly sort of a single effort that we all pursue together or we just do it in alignment. Um, How do we get options. to that point where we, I mean, I haven't been in a discussion where, you know, we've talked about that at like the finance committee or here at the city council. Is this, um, city staff discussions across the county and various boards or agencies. I, I'm just trying to get some idea of how this works. So is this a asking specifically towards this community grant, the community yeah. grant effort? I mean, I, I think that what, what you could do if you were interested in pursuing something like that is asking staff to come back with what would a model be to better integrate with the overall, you know, okay. other efforts that taking place throughout the county with community grants. So the following discussion, we'll probably get to something like that. Thank yeah. you very much. That's my questions. Okay. Thank you. Additional questions? No? All right. Thank you so much for that presentation. You're, you're very welcome. Uh, we will move on now to public comment. This is a time for members of the public to address the council on this item. Uh, please feel free to line up uh, at the podium and along the wall there, and um, you will have three minutes to address the council. Hi, welcome. Hi, let's try this again since oh. I was so <laughs> eager last time. Um, my name is Gabrielle DeMariano and I am with Dante's Community Dental and I'm here to thank the city of Capitola and the leaders of the Capitola Community Grants Program for all of the support over these last years. Um, I also wanna thank Nicole Lezen and Nicole Young for reaching out to us during this process for feedback. Um, Dante's values the city's support and looks forward to the opportunity to continue this partnership as the community grants program evolves. Um, your support has had a direct impact on the residents of Capitola. Because of you, we have been able to provide 479 uninsured Capitola residents with comprehensive dental care through 1,600 visits in the last year. Um, with your continued support and our new clinic opening in 2021, 
we will be able to serve more patients and increase access to vital dental care, making a healthy community for all those who reside in Capitola and also throughout the greater Santa Cruz County. So I just wanted to say thank you and um, support this program. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Um, is that, I, I believe we need to wait for questions until after public comment. Yes, after public comment, we can come back to more questions. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, um, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Lisa Berkowitz, and I'm representing Meals on Wheels, a program of Community Bridges. Uh, I first would like to, on behalf of all of the Capitola Seniors Meals on Wheels serves, thank you for your many years of support. Um, reviewing the city's uh, community grants funding process, as you know, will require council members to identify, review, and prioritize community needs, a, a tough job to do. Um, as a program that serves the 60 plus population of Capitola, I wanted to share with you early in your review process some of the significant changes in the aging population. I have a chart prepared by the California Department of Finance. Yeah. That's over there. Uh, <coughs> that um, it, it's a chart prepared by the California Department of Finance and the projections outline the increase in the statewide 60 plus population from 2011 to 2018. Um, turning the page over reveals that uh, an even larger increase in the 60 plus population for Santa Cruz County. Um, equally as important as the information for the council to be aware of is the fact that 65 percent of the seniors we are now serving are living at or below the fe uh, federal poverty guideline and this represents a significant increase in the number of low-income seniors we're serving in the program and a significant decrease in their capability to donate for services Additionally, uh, please note that we feel omitting the question that asks what would be the impact to Capitola residents if this program is not funded limits the council's knowledge. Uh, frequently cuts made from a single funding source impacts service delivery across the county. So it, obviously it's important information the council would need to know. And lastly, <coughs> excuse me, a note from a Capitola senior that we received on 46th Avenue who summed up the importance of the meal she receives. Decisions are easy to make when your health is intact, your wages are intact, and your daily life moves forward without fear of being able to feed yourself. That is not the case for myself and many others on the program. We need that food. It's not an abundance or a free ride. It's our daily regimen. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Hello, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Kirk Ants. I represent LiftLine, a program of Community Bridges. And also, LiftLine is the designated consolidated transportation service agency for Santa Cruz County. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for your many years of funding and support to LiftLine and partnership. Uh, with your help, we're able to provide paratransit service to low income, elderly, and disabled uh, residents of Capitola to medical appointments, dentist appointments, pharmacies. Uh, VA hospitals and uh, out of county transportation to medical specialists. So the uh, transportation is very important to them. Um, also, in uh, review of the grant process, uh, LiftLine is really in favor kind of of the status quo because we know it and it's easy for us. But on behalf of uh, Community Bridges, it looked like there was a suggestion of possibly removing one of the questions from the application, which was the question that states, what would be the impact to Capitola if this program is not funded? Uh, Community Bridges would like to suggest uh, leaving that in there if it comes to that point where there's an option to make a decision around there because ultimately this question is critically important in making the case of 
what the impacts would be if not funded. So we, we'd like you to consider that. And thank you again very much for your support to Lift Line and Community Bridges. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Helen Yoon Story. I'm the Assistant Director for the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. And um, like many others, I want to thank you for your thoughtful um, review of the community grants process and your ongoing um, support of uh, community organizations that provide vital services to um, you know members of, of Capitola and the larger community as well. Uh, we're our current grantee um, serving Capitola households uh, with rental assistance to avoid eviction and homelessness. And so your support is really critical in terms of um, providing that stability in the city. Um, we greatly appreciate your multiple year contracting process with your COLAs. Uh, I think that's been a really critical process um, and uh, element of your process. And I hope that continues in any changes. Um, but in reviewing uh, uh, the report, we definitely support elements of option two with some incremental changes in the process. And um, specifically, uh, any streamlining of application for clarity and, and uh, uh, standardizing reporting is always appreciated. Um, you know, as noted in the report, um, you know, you do help support a lot of different organizations with small grants. And I think any time we can reduce the amount of time that we spend on applying or reporting for a grant and devote that time to providing the direct services is really appreciated. So we certainly support that. Um, like others, I support continuing to have that question about what would be the impact if um, services were not provided. I think that's important for you to, um, to see that in your evaluation of funding decisions. Um, and then also, uh, one of CAB's core values is equity. And so we certainly support um, an equitable distribution of um, funding resources to meet community needs. Um, we also support an alignment and acknowledgement of other jurisdictional funding processes like CORE and others, um, wi while also hoping that there's some flexibility for some uh, local priorities, um, kind of similar to what uh, Watsonville's process is. Um, so I would really encourage you uh, to look at that. Um, but given all that, I really think that a lot of the current um, grantees are going to meet those elements, um, uh, you know, supporting um, different um, needs in the community that are critical. And so uh, we really want to encourage you as part of this process to also consider increasing your overall community grants um, program funding in order to meet all the needs that are critical for the city. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Hello, good evening. My name is Keisha Browder. I'm CEO of Your United Way of Santa Cruz County. And I want to first just commend you as a city for taking the time to really assess your community grants project. We can all just do business as usual because it's easy. It requires a low level of commitment. But for the city of Capitola to take this time and be intentional about looking at their process and, and learning ways that we can improve it, I want to take that time to commend you. I thank you for supporting 211. You may not know, but our 211 turned 10 years old on 211. Makes it easy, 211. 211. Um, and so we just really truly thank you. Um, about 4% of our calls, uh, we have about 4,000 calls that come in a year. About 4% of those calls do come from Capitola. So I am here to say that uh, please count on and lean on your United Way. We have data that can go into granular um, uh, work. We can look at the city. We can help you identify those priorities just with our data as well as data share. So I am here just to offer our help that you don't have to go and pay for more research. We have the research. We've done it for you. So just know that you can count on your United Way to help you with identifying those priorities. Definitely keep that question in because it's a a very serious question about the impact if you don't continue funding. And as a United Way, we were able to look at the data that we create here with the Community Assessment Project, and we were able to identify um, youth success, 
um, looking towards more prevention work as our priority for the next three years. And so that's what Nicole was referring to. Also our partnership with CORE, uh, with the county and the city of Santa Cruz. So um, I am here to offer help and talk to you about co-investments and what that looks like because United Way is definitely doing that here in, in Santa Cruz County. So count on us. You don't have to go buy research and data. We already have it for you and we can help you with this process. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Good evening. My name is Leila Bratovic and I'm the Executive Director of the Conflict Resolution Center of Santa Cruz County. So I really want to support everything that Helen and Keisha have just said in terms of the report and uh, continuing the funding of the agencies. Uh, CRC is one of those agencies that does receive the small grant and uh, it, it does make a lot of difference. So for us, all of that funding, uh, even, even you know, the small, the large, all of it really makes a difference. And the, the COLA additions to it is really appreciated, and uh, I especially in the terms when a lot of the other grants and funding uh, do not account for that at all. So um, thank you for doing that. And thank you for also uh, evaluating and making sure that uh, the funds are being used in the best way uh, possible. So as uh, you know, Conflict Resolution Center offers mediation, conflict resolution services, training for all of the residents of Santa Cruz County. We've served uh, just over 3,000 residents in the past, in the county for the past uh, year. And out of those 3,000 or just over, about 10% are from Capitola. And those go from, uh, we, we have uh, mediation at the small claims court for div affordable divorce mediation. We do a lot of our, uh, most of our co Capitola uh, mediations are around uh, s with seniors, with uh, homeowners association, with senior living situations, with family. Also we've seen an increase where a lot of our mediations are about uh, the elder care by their um, by by their also elder um, children, so it has been a very interesting shift that we've seen over over this past time. This last year, we were also participating, and you know it's nice to see all the friends here with so many partners here in uh, community law enforcement dialogues, where we had a circle here in Capitola. I, w I was part of that circle. So it was great to see the Capitola law enforcement part of it all uh, with community, with engaging with youth, looking at different ways how we can, not just as the city of Capitola, but as a county as a whole, because yes, you're right, we cannot separate ourselves. We, we are part of the bigger picture, wherever we're from. So um, our, our another, um, I'll come another time and talk about a new project that we're just getting started with uh, the neighborhood courts. And uh, I'm really excited about that. That's just getting off the ground. And so you'll be hearing more about that as we're coming up. So thank you very much. And uh, I really uh, hope that you continue supporting all of our community grants. And you still need to come to our training. Yes. <laughs> oh, you remembered. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Hello, welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Creighton Mendeval. I'm the executive director and directing attorney for Senior Citizens Legal Services. And we serve Santa Cruz and San Benito counties. Uh, we serve about six to 700 clients a year for direct legal services. And approximately 100 of those come from the city of Capitola. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, things that I want to make sure that you consider in this process. One is the core evidence-based process does not work, at least for our agency. They want evidence-based <coughs> and studies based on it, and they want double-blind studies. To the best of my knowledge, there are not people who don't know that they're attorneys giving legal advice to the public and comparing that to attorneys giving legal advice. 
So when we went through the evidence-based process, there were no studies for us to work with. Um, and we do what we do because it works. So we help people over 60 with housing issues, with um, access to their uh, public benefits, and elder abuse prevention. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is longer funding contracts are wonderful. We're a very small agency. We have a budget of about $300,000 a year, and we're serving six to 700 clients a year. We have three staff. So I, as the executive director, if I'm being pulled off to do applications and reports, any way you can streamline that process to allow me to help more of the seniors in Capitola and Santa Cruz and San Benito counties is wonderful. Any way that you can simplify the application, I am all in favor for it. And clarification of the, um, the process is very much appreciated. Um, I also wanna talk about the safety net. Um, the concept of moving the funding to larger agencies and cutting out smaller agencies, we're like a safety net. And if you start removing strands of the net, people fall through. And that's my big concern, at least with the one look out of it just to moving to larger agencies. Um, communication with grantees is always helpful. And in the last process, we lost $2,000 in the process to allow people to get a COLA increase, which we got a COLA increase, thank you for that. But our loss of $2,000 negatively affected us. And I can't say that we helped less people because we lost money, because we just keep doing it. But it does affect our retention of staff, how we can pay our people, and our ability to keep quality people so we can keep doing quality services for you folks. Thank you. Thank you. I stopped before the bell. OK. <laughs> I was afraid of the buzzer. Hello, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm Tim Bratton at Gray Bears. Um, you know, this is, uh, I've just learned about this uh, process. I favor everything that's been said. I think streamlining uh, the application process is great because I do also wear a lot of hats. At Gray Bears, we operate with a pretty meager staff and about 500 volunteers that we have to manage and, uh, and keep happy uh, every week. Um, I think for, for what we've seen with the core process and what we've learned as an agency, I think is important because it gave us some way to evaluate our work. It made us uh, look at the way that we provide service. It uh, created ways that we can improve the services that we offer. And it gave us a way to, to, um, to uh, create outcomes that are reasonable. Uh, are people better off? Are they eating more fruits and vegetables from the bags that we deliver but to about 300 Capitola residents every year? Uh, do they feel better? And are they able to save money on food costs? Those are basic needs that we provide that are really clear and really easy to understand. And part of our work is also volunteerism. About 45 Capitola residents come to our agency every, uh, every day and, offer and donate in the last grant period about 6,000 hours of service. In, in, in that work, they rub elbows with other people, they create relationships and friendships, they create support systems, and they get to have breakfast and lunch and take home groceries too. So a lot of what we do uh, really, uh, really addresses uh, where the um, where those who are on the edge of poverty live and are one expense away from you know calamity essentially so we're addressing those needs and we're really grateful for the work that we've done together with you for all the years that you have and all the agencies that you support here we look forward to the process and um, and working with you in the future thank you thank you I want to thank all the uh, people in our community who are with these organizations helping those in need. And um, Tim Bratton, I've heard you 
interviewed on the radio. I know the Gray Bears uh, really is a wonderful organization. Senior Citizens Legal Services. I had wonderful help from them uh, at one time with someone who was on my property that um, wasn't pleasant, and Senior Citizens Legal Services uh, did an excellent, excellent job. I often ask, why is there such hunger and homelessness? What is the matter with this picture in one of the wealthiest nations on the planet? And I have a visual here. Uh, I'll give you feeling sad and depressed, and you see a, a young medic with a stethoscope around his neck and a clipboard, and it says, um, are you anxious, worried about the future, feeling isolated and alone? You might be suffering from capitalism. Symptoms include unemployment, homelessness, hunger, and the list goes on, feelings of depression, loss of free speech, cultural dis uh, decay, um, uh, thoughts, uh, revolutionary thoughts, death, and I think of every time I pay taxes, and I've read from War Resisters League, over half of our tax dollars are siphoned out of our communities to go to the exorbitant military budget. I don't like what our country is doing militarily with over 800 military bases and killing poor people in other countries for profit of the war industry. Um, so we need to have a structural change. I don't know how to do that. So we don't have so many homeless people, hungry people, unemployed. And I will leave you with this. I know you're doing all you can do, but I think what you could do if that money were staying in our community. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, is there any other member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we're gonna bring it back to the council for a uh, discussion and a vote. Council Member Brooks, or Vice Mayor Brooks, excuse me. Sure, I'll go ahead and start. Um, I appreciate everyone coming this evening. Um, it's always a pleasure hearing about all of the programs uh, in our community and all the exceptional work that you do. I, I get to see it out there in the community. It's, it's a beautiful thing, so thank you for showing up tonight. Um, with regards to the presentation, Nicole, thank you also. Um, I, I agree. I think that it's important that we find balance in, um, in how we distribute the funds in with throughout the community i i think it's important for a system to be created by our council members to prioritize um, our community needs and we're missing that um, i'm particularly com particularly concerned about the unmet needs we and that's the biggest gap here we are doing so many great things we're funding so many great organizations so far and have done so for a very long time we just aren't sure where where those unmet needs are and I feel where we grapple with that so by setting a process in place um, would really help us move in the right direction or at least I believe that um, and more importantly not duplicating things um, uh, that are already taking place there there was mention of core and I'm not sure if that's the process or but I know that other organizations and uh, cities and community uh, members are coming together to ensure that we're not duplicating needs and really, uh, really stretching those dollars uh, to the to the fullest to benefit all of our community members. Um, so, a couple of things that I heard, I um, I'm in agreement with the option two. For st uh, I I think that is a uh, a starting point. I I would hope that if I guess I can start with a motion and then we can go from there. 
Um, I, I would like to see staff come back with a more meaty uh, process that there was a several steps introduced in option two but for the, for you to come back on what that would look like what that timeline would look like i would really like for us to utilize uh united way and their free ser their services and that data that they already offer so we don't have to pay anything in addition from what we've already done um and see if we can actually utilize staff's time in setting those priorities with the help of united way um, I think that it, the we can update the application though immediately based off of the information that Nicole gave us this evening. Um, there was plenty of feedback there that I think we can just move on that without waiting any further. Um, and thank you for noting the question. Nicole, was that question being answered somewhere else in the application process? Is that why you took it away? I know I'm halfway through a motion, I'm sorry, but let me just get clarification before. Yes, thanks for saying that. We did feel that that was captured in another question okay. about the, the methods and tools that were used to measure impact, and right. it was duplicative to ask it twice in two different ways. That's what I thought, so, so I don't think there would be a need thanks. To, to do that. Maybe we can look at editing, if again, you can come back with if that's, if in fact that question is being answered in its entirety, so that we're not losing any anything there. Um, and to possibly examining, examine once we set those priorities, I just want to say that um, for us to pull out that dedicated children's fund, so once the council sets those priorities, that we look at those funds on a separate, um, separately. So that would be my motion with all those things. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll, I'll second that with continued discussion. Okay. Is that the conclusion you're saying? Yeah, that's okay. it. That's all I got. <laughs> Further comments? Councilmember Bator. Sure, yeah. Um, thank you for those comments, uh, um, Vice Mayor. I, I, I appreciate everything you said. And I do want to thank all the groups that came here tonight. Um, you know, the, the, the history of this is that we've been struggling with allocation of money for probably at least four years that I can think of. Um, when you think about where we're at right now, there's, there's option one, which is, says maintain the status quo. And this really wasn't working for us because we, you know, just keeping the same groups, not allowing anybody else to come in, allocating the same money every year, um, really we weren't sure that it was doing with the best for Capitola and it, it maybe didn't give some groups uh, a chance to get in and, and we realized that the most important thing, or not the most important thing, but one of the most, one of the important things to the, the groups was that, that uh, consideration of, of continued funding and we appreciate that. Um, I can tell you I'm here tonight not to vote for option one, which is maintain status quo, and it's not to eliminate. So we're, we're all, I think, in agreement. That's why I seconded the motion for option two. But option two is very broad at this point. And, and you know, when, when you bring in a consultant, they're to give you options, and, and that's what we're here to do tonight is to try to whittle that down. I, uh, even within the four uh, options in, uh, do, in, in, in uh, option two, there's many bullet points, which, you know, that I, I feel what I'm going to do is I'm compelled to, I'm going to send a written letter to the city manager to give input about, you know, the things that I do, that I have feelings on, because some of them I think are going to get us closer to that goal, which is at least what I believe, because I, I sat on a committee with uh, the mayor a couple years ago to try to sit down and go through the uh, each individual person we provide to, which is pretty broad. I think it's over 40 and uh, find out which, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, which which uh, group was the biggest bang for the buck for the citizens of Capitola. And, you know, th there's just some uh, services that are provided that, that we cannot go without, okay? And I'm, I'm not trying to, I don't want to pick those out at this time, but, you know, there's, there's very important groups that exist, and there's some that maybe not so much, and we just want to make sure that we're giving our citizens the best look we can do for that. Um, I do, out of this process, I do believe that our application process does need to be streamlined. There's five items here that I'm going to talk about that, uh, that uh, Nicole brought up. And Nicole, thank you very much for the, the time you spent. And I'm not sure if it was you I talked to on the phone or the other Nicole. Okay, good. All right. Uh, thanks for clarifying that. Um, the application does need to be streamlined. That will help us uh, just to, and make it easier on you. I believe it makes it easier when you do that. Um, the identify priority need based on community level indicators. Absolutely, that's where we want to get. Uh, develop a weighted checklist. That's good. Um, 
you know, the considering of the tiered, you know, what, something was brought up tonight, and this is, this is a reality check for us. You know, every time we come up here with any project, it's always easy for us to make that project better by throwing more money at it. And, you know, one of the things says, is, you know, we can, we can do that with community grants, but the reality of it is, is, you know, Capitol has some challenging times coming up. You know, we're, we're getting ready to do a great big mall uh, redevelopment, which we hope is gonna put us in a prosper, prosperous position down the road. The sad part of that is, is that for a period of about two or three years, they're gonna tear down the mall which means that we lose revenue of over a million dollars a year for two or three years. So, you know, when you say that it's sensitive to you and you lose an allocation, think about us, you know, absorbing a million dollar loss a year, which puts us in a situation where we can't be very generous when we're trying to do that because we're just trying to pay the bills at home to keep the lights on. So um, I think you need to bear, you know, be aware of the fact that we're going to be struggling for a couple of years, and, and I, I think we all remain optimistic that the big move we're making with the mall is going to put us in a better position moving forward. But uh, that's one thing that I worry about. But that, that kind of gets off the topic, but I just want you to know that, that we all take this very seriously. I take this seriously. I appreciate the efforts that the consultant did. Uh, it it kind of puts it more on us to give our feedback uh, we can all come together. I think we're, we're uh, you know, this motion will probably pass with option two. Um, and I think what we're all going to try to do is work really hard over, it says here, for the next one to two years to come up with a good program. And I'm excited that we have finally got to this point where, you know, we spent a little bit of money, uh, got some input, stimulated us, and collectively I think we're going to end up with a better program that works for the citizens of Capitola and for all the groups that I believe are here tonight. So thank you for coming and speaking to us. Councilmember Bertrand. I almost can't add a lot, but um, there's a lot in here that in my sense is fairly general and there's a need to put it in context. And the reason why I say in context, um, when this process started, at least on the county level, there was a report that said, okay, we could go to a need space assessment, which I read, or we could think in terms of sort of like what Creighton was talking about. And you just can't figure out based on data how this is positively influencing society. And so he spoke from the standpoint of the senior citizens um, legal services. Um, I was able to connect a person who was at a mobile home park who was being bullied by the owner of the mobile home park. And this particular mobile home that this person had was basically her life savings. And she needed to sell it so that she could get in a home and have care for the rest of her life, whatever that might be. And it was this legal services group that came to her aid and enabled her to sell this in opposition to what the owner of the home, uh, the mobile home park wants. Um, a lady came here and talked about uh, dientes. Um, I know an individual homeless person that um, for all intents and purposes, you thought he got in a multiple number of fights. He didn't have any teeth. He just looked horrible. He actually got some services from a dental agency, not dientes. This guy lived up somewhere in Mendocino, but it was someone I knew. And it turned out that he was a civil engineer. He got his teeth fixed, and he was back on the job building bridges. You know, someone mentioned that the services that we help support help a network of things that keeps our community alive. And in many respects, capital is unusual in that we pride ourselves in trying to keep this network alive by contributing perhaps in a small way to some agencies and a larger way in other agencies but it helps keep our network alive for this community for those especially who can't afford to do things on their own so when we come up with our criteria I'm looking for a way to see how these agencies benefit short of whatever data that has double blind behind and stuff like that, which is actually very expensive to do. 
I was on the senior council for many years, and there was two PhD statisticians on that who were just, they couldn't believe that this was being asked of many of the organizations here because there is not a base of data that shows what you can compare to to see what you could be doing better. It's, there's many ways that you could say that doing these kind of statistical analysis don't work, especially the load on the organizations in terms of staff time and expertise. It's just not there. But there are cases where it does make sense. Tim just talked about how his organization has been at benefit extraordinary from this effort. So I think when we come up with criteria, I want to balance. I hope that we look out from the standpoint that there's some places where evidence-based whatever works, and there's some bases where just dealing with the network of people and the needs of people, those who just don't have a much as much as we have. And so I hope that when we come back in the next one or two years and think about what our system is going to be, we try to create a balance between different ways of evaluating organizations and recognize sometimes it works just because we're helping people. And sometimes it works because we're actually helping someone get out of the rut of their life and improving themselves. I'm going to vote for a... Um, option two, but I'm also looking forward to how our staff is going to help us develop some more definite programs and options to help out and um, carrying this option forward. Great. Um, I would like to thank everyone who came out tonight and, and even those who aren't able to be here um, in person. The work that community programs do um, to support um, all of our community is incredibly valuable and um, I, I really can't say enough good things about um, community organizations and nonprofit organizations and uh, we are just so very lucky as a community to have you here doing the work that, that you are all doing um, I, I really can't add much that wasn't already said um, I think option two is probably the best option for for incrementally um, improving the system that we have now. Um, I uh, support the motion, but I, I'm going to seek uh, clarification on it if, if allowed. Um, I have some concerns about using any one uh, organization's data to make all of our decisions, especially if that organization is, is a grantee, one of our um, agencies that receives our grant funding. Um, I, I'm wondering if our city attorney can provide any guidance on that on if we would be making decisions based on data provided by one of the individual organizations that would receive our grant funding if that is um, I don't I don't want to say if it's legal is it is it recommended um, or I believe that the the data I mean for example I know that we reached out to our grant uh, our grantees to get information just for this uh, recommendation so clearly Using um, information from our grantees is a great idea, but I'm wondering if using just one grantee's data set and data information is is wise. Let me take a stab at it rather than city sure. attorney and sure. Samantha can chime in if I miss something. So first off, I, what I what I would suggest is is with the work plan is, is we would develop a work plan for how sort of chart a path forward for how we might begin to implement option two. And we will include a couple of different options about different paths to pursue, pursue whether there's in-house resources, whether we use lean on a nonprofit for assistance, whether we get some proposals potentially from other partners to do the help. Um, in terms of what data are going to be used to underlie that, I wouldn't worry too much about. I don't think the United Way generates a ton of sort of um, original data. I think they often will coalesce data from a lot of different sources. Their community indicators project is a great example of that. They're pulling data from a lot of different places. It's not data that they just collected. It's data that, you know, maybe the county pulled together. And so they have information, but I think um, I wouldn't, I, personally, I think it's fine to use data from, they're more of a repository, if you will, than um, actually the ones doing a lot of the data collecting in most cases. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. That, that um, clarifies a lot for me. I appreciate it. Um, with uh, any additional comments? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
that was a point I wanted to comment on too. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, Senior Council does an extensive survey as well as United Way. There's many different sources of information. And um, so in that one particular source would uh, bias something, you know, I would not like that, I have to admit. So I would like to have your plan moving forward, take into account a lot of different perspectives in terms of um, what information we can. All right. Uh, with that, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. Okay. Can we treat all council members? Yes. Can we um, bring council member story back? Yeah. All right. And we're just going to take a moment while he returns. Thank you. I hate to butcher people's I do. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. That's good. That's good. Okay. Oh. That good. I'm glad to return the favor. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I caught you in a mid pour. I know. I should have asked you if I could. No, it was, you were really just water. I know. All right. You say a little bit. I don't want to drink I need it. more water as I go older. I don't know about you. Just like just a tree. I, don't, I never used to drink water. Never. <laughs> Who's this guy? I recognize you. Oh, that's right. Welcome You're, back. Yeah, well, oh, that's yeah. right. You've only been gone so long. And All right. It's been a while. Did you watch? Yeah. All right. So uh, we're going to move on now to item 10B, consider proposed recreation strategic plan. Uh, Mayor Peterson, council members, the item before you tonight is um, the recreation division strategic plan. So... In February, uh, Council approved funding for a recre recreation strategic plan project. Um, Blue Point Planning, a consulting firm, uh, was chosen to facilitate the development of this plan. Originally, uh, that consultant, Mindy, was planned to be here to give this presentation tonight. Unfortunately, she spiked a pretty high fever and is unable to be present. So I will be conducting the entire presentation. Um, so with the proposed plan, uh, it would begin with the upcoming fiscal year 2021. So to go into, um, the process for this plan was, took place over a span of six months. Um, it involved with the, uh, consultants facilitation. Um, we established a core team. That core team was comprised of a number of Capitola staff as well as community members and stakeholder groups. Um, that core team met, uh, did an orientation call to kind of discuss and give ideas as to where we wanted this plan to go. Um, and then with the consultant reviewing all of the data that we had available as well as information from the core team given in a meeting, did a review on the existing conditions of our recreation division. And we started to work on developing some visions and goals and identifying the needs, gaps, needs and gaps and opportunities. Um, that core team then took a lot of that information and started to outline those goals and strategies um, that if the plan was um, approved, we would start to implement. So, the, the, ulti excuse me, the ultimate goal of this strategic plan is to create exactly that, a roadmap um, for the recreation division um, in order to provide what the community wants and needs. Um, it also allows us to understand better how we might be able to maximize the use and functions of the parks and facilities and identify programs 
that we should maybe grow or add based on those community needs. Um, and then one of the things that was also identified is to be able to establish partnership connections and efficiencies um, with other, with city and community services such as events, parks, and the library, and ultimately have that be a tool to communicate those priorities to the community. So with that as kind of the, the ultimate purpose, the first place that that core team along with the consultant started is to review the mission, vision, and values for the recreation division. Um, the, what really came up, the mission was a modification of something that had already established, but we incorporated intergenerational um, as a key point of this mission, and we also incorporated um, supporting health and well being uh, into this new mission statement. And the vision, which was a, a, an entirely new aspect of the division, um, provided to the goal was to focus on being a progressive division that would evolve and be responsive to the needs of the community. Um, identifying the values of being community oriented, being collaborative with partners and within the city, um, try, striving to be innovative, ensuring that we are an efficient division, and also the important piece of being affordable to the community. And so using, from there, we started to develop um, four different goals, and each goal had a set of strategies. So I'm gonna go through each one of those goals um, and touch lightly on the different strategies. So the first goal, as uh, we began that conversation, the core team and the consultant looking at the information that came out of the, um, survey that we had circulated, uh, we really started to identify that there was an opportunity to develop some efficiencies in order to be a more effective umbrella organization. So goal one, efficient and effective umbrella organization with the idea that we would um, have the organization provide programming, programming in parks, events, and recreation uh, that would be resourced, efficient, and effective. And so some of the areas to develop better efficiencies um, were I identified as such. So one, for one of them would be to um, begin to incorporate or to evaluate the relationship with the city events um, and the recreation division and start to um, in coordination with the Arts and Cultural Commission, figure out if there is efficiencies to be able to had in that process, um, as well as to develop a process for um, incorporating parks programming in conjunction with the Public Works Department. Whereas a lot of people already assume that recreation deals hand in hand with parks, and so to intentionally have the um, programming of parks involved in this plan. Uh, also, to uh, evaluate the division's role in the issuance of special events permits um, with the, in coordination with the police department. A lot of times, members of the public call us first in order to do, do their special events permits, and this is one of those things that we identified could have more efficiencies built in. Um, and then with that, in building that new, or idea of building that new division, uh, would be to then incorporate the addition of events parks with uh, or the organization with clear job titles and resources to support those activities. And then of course the establishing budgetary parameters for that new division um, and needs for fundraising or grants or other general fund allocations. So that's goal, the first goal. The second goal it was to be affordable and accessible. So with the intention here was to annually update and refine recreation programs and events 
um, so that they, to ensure that they were balanced, relevant, and affordable, and accessible to all community members, regardless of age, socioeconomic status, or ability. Um, so the first strategy uh, that to implement for that goal would be to establish a cost recovery policy that would enable more access, and this would, could, would have multiple different facets to it, such as fees, but also scholarship or other areas for funding. Um, explore the needs and roles of a community advisory group in order to ensure that we are staying in touch with what uh, the new programs that we would be offering and if they were uh, maintaining that goal or vision to be relevant and to stay progressive. Um, expand and develop those relationships with educational organizations outside the city um, in hopes to promote internship opportunities as well as um, increase availability to team programs. And then to optimize parks, facilities, and other pilot partner locations uh, to pilot programs throughout the city and systematically evaluate and update programs and offerings to ensure that they serve the community as a whole. For the third goal would be to maximize the facilities. So for this one by 2022 uh, would be to complete an assessment of all city recreation and park facilities, prioritize res renovations, additions, and ongoing maintenance to maximize function and flexibility to support the division's missions. We had the core group, that core team, as well as along with the consultant, had a lot of conversations about um, what opportunities we would have regarding facilities and being able to really optimize a lot of that. And so the strategies that uh, we had discussed about, discussed, would be to start off with inventorying the existing um, facilities that we have and conduct that needs assessment. And then from there, prioritize those facility upgrades to ensure that we are supporting the programs that we offer and um, to improve the efficiencies and broad and sorry, broaden services to the community. And then finally, to identify and help develop any additional park facilities um, associated with other resources or new development. And then finally, uh, the, our fourth goal is the partnership piece. Um, so in, with this goal, by 2020, to establish agreements with the school district, library, and other organizations to secure the use of facilities and shared use to expand the ability to provide a range of services. Um, and really, you know, we already have a lot of really great strong partners and this is building, continuing to build, as well as creating the opportunity for um, new partnerships. So to cooperate with the school district, uh, to establish a long-term MOU regarding the shared use uh, and programming of city and district facilities, uh, to establish an MOU with the library for programming and use of those facilities at the new library. And then to foster relationships with other public as well as private, rec private recreation events and park providers um, and amplify opportunities to serve residents. And then finally, um, to ensure that there is funding um, with partners and in order to have the benefits and shared resources of those cooperative services. So my recommendation for you would be to approve um, the five-year recreation strategic plan. And at this time, I am happy to answer questions. All right, is there any questions from council? None? Yes, no, council member story. Questions. Thank you. Um, so we've been asked to approve um, the five-year uh, strategic plan and I was just wondering, in, um, in your mind, what does that mean? Does that, what kind of commitment does that uh, put the city into? Um, so 
the the plan at this point is that kind of collection and analysis that the group and the consultant put together. And so approving this strategic plan is kind of that springboard to, yes, we agree that this work is relevant and will make our division strong and please begin. <laughs> um, so that it is starting the intent of um, these goals and strategies in order to ensure that we're going in a direction that, the, that is what the community desires. And at some point, if in any evaluative process, we decide mm, actually this isn't the right thing, built into the strategic plan is to continue to do that analysis um, to ensure that with this intent, we are trying to still be relevant and provide that provide those services to the community, working with the partners and working within the city um, for those goals. If one, if I may go on, Please. Mayor. Yeah, if one of the strategies um, are to prioritize facility upgrades, um, is that a commitment on the part of the council to prioritize that over any other uh, budgetary needs? Uh, no, I don't think so. The um, the that language specifically was very thoughtful in trying to identify in choosing the word prioritize um, because there within public works there are a lot of different things to take into consideration um, and in re in relationship to the programs that are happening in relationship to the current status of where we're at, because it may be three years down the road, um, to look at that list and make those priorities. Um, I don't know if Steve or Jamie wants to expand on that at all. That's okay. I mean, it, either we're prioritizing or we're not, and it sounds like it's saying we're not really committing that this is going to be the council priority uh, in terms of our capital expenditures budget. So it's, it's not a pre-commitment to... It's not a pre-commitment. <clears throat> I, th I think the best way to think about this is, is it's, you know, it's laying out sort of work plan items for recreation and a direction and a trajectory for Nikki and the team to be working towards. <clears throat> In and of itself, adopting the plan doesn't bind us to any future action. Okay. It's really just laying, I think, out a general trajectory for different work items and things to come back to the council. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, there, in reference to the um, Art and Cultural Commission and the events, um, with Parks and Rec serving as an umbrella organization over those events that the Arts and Cultural Commission has uh, is putting on, has put on for many years. Um, my understanding is that has not been presented to the Arts and Cultural Commission, this concept and um, therefore they've had no opportunity to give feedback on it mm -hmm. at this point. Um, the same thing with public works, has public works and the police department given feedback uh, on, uh, on their roles in this strategic plan? So um, regarding the Arts and Cultural Commission, that was brought to my attention today for the first time. Um, and that not, was not my understanding. Uh, so I do apologize for, for that miscommunication. Um, but regarding Public Works and the Police Department, they are aware um, of, the, of, of setting this intent with the strategic plan and um, are on board uh, to do the work. Okay. Um, and my, I think my final question is there's many of these um, uh, strategic goals in my mind have budgetary cost um, and has there been some thought of, 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 of a budget being proposed at this or is that going to follow um, after we adopt this plan um, because that my my sense is I mean when we we're talking about public works and um, I mean it, you are the parks and recs I mean that kind of makes some sense but if we're going to be uh, putting on more programming in the parks, to me that means staff, that means more public works 
follow-up and attention, um, which means more general fund. Um, and so um, I think an important follow-up to this is, is uh, it needs to be to have some budgetary projections about what, what are we really proposing here in terms of how it's going to impact the general fund. And as well as, you know, um, about making the programs affordable for the community, um, that also the corollary to that is that it means more of a general fund contribution from the city of Capitola. You know, and so we already put in a little bit over 300,000. Um, so is, is there going to, is the follow-up to this going to be a proposed increase in the general fund contributions um, to the Parks and Recs Division? So in short, yes. Um, the, like I said, this, the, the plan, the intent of the, of the plan at this point is to create <coughs> the next work plan for the division for the next five years. And you're exactly correct. There's not the kind of micro details of a budget, um, because in order to get there, a certain amount of work would need to be done in partnership with city departments and other partners within the community to really identify what it is that we are then going to do. And from there, a lot of those details that would then come out and materialize in budgets that you would then hear. Thank you. Questions, Vice Mayor Vex? I have a couple questions. Um, you mentioned a cost recovery policy. Can you elaborate on what that means? Yeah, so um, this, this came out of one of the broader conversations in the core team where, I, since I'm new, particularly not in my history, but of a known history, there's never been an, an, a, a discussion as to what is the intent for our um, recreation division. Are we, are we at trying to be balanced? Are we trying to, you know, what, what is that ultimate goal? And to kind of do, do that analysis of um, recreation division as a whole, mm -hmm. where, what are the fees producing, um, and as we grow and change, where we're going with that. So to have a intentional decision that this is, this is what we're committing to, and this is kind of that guiding idea of what our budgets are gonna be, and, um, our resources, how they will be used. Okay, um, yeah, I had similar concerns um, as by council member stories about, you know, the feasibility of these priorities and really, you know, are we setting you up for success or are we setting you up for failure by, by really, uh, by agreeing to this, this plan here. Um, you mentioned conducting a needs assessment. So I, I hear that and I'm thinking just more and more money. Do you feel um, that the outcome of this is setting you up for success in, in that this is really sounding like a really expensive plan to, to pursue? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting, I, I wouldn't have considered that perspective. So um, do I think that this is setting us up for success? Yes, I do. Um, I, at this point, I feel that this plan is really setting the intent in order to do the evaluative work in order to ensure that we are able to hit goals or evaluate that these goals are not meant for the division and for this for the city um so short answer yes okay. um did i miss a part of your question i feel no like I no i okay. think yeah it just thank you mm -hmm. that sums it up questions no questions so um, you just sort of recently found out about the community, excuse me, the um, Arts and Cultural Committee, right? So I was wondering how you're going to address that. Um, in a sense, they're a stakeholder, and they represent many um, long-established groups, the uh, events that have been long-established here in Capitola, which um, are considered by many an important fabric, part of our fabric here. So. Um, 
maybe you don't have to say it right now because you're just finding out about it, but um, I would like to see you know some reach out to the uh, Cultural Commission, some reach out to uh, some of the groups, or all of the groups that have been instrumental in you know the spirit of Capitola, you know the various festivals um, that we've had for many many years, and also considering that the in, the number of volunteers that those efforts represent is, is immense, right? So I I have full faith that you will do that. Um, I I would like you to take the time if you can to to explain a little bit how you got to the point of realizing that a strategic plan was needed and how you feel it's going to work for the department in the next couple of years. Just maybe, you know, I, I, when you started here, you must have felt something that needed to be attended to. And so I'm thinking, um, my question is a, an effort to try to give you a chance to say what you saw and why you wanted to do this. Um, so when I started working with the city a little over a year ago, um, I entered into the division with the goal set before me is let's try and figure out what we are able to do. Um, that the division had been operating for a number of years at kind of a, a status quo for a bit and we've had the opportunity um, with changing in staff in order to um, figure out what we would be able to do and it is helpful to have guidance when you're making those plans and so ultimately when I started off trying to um, have with the strategic plan it was with the goal of providing for the community what they want and working and identifying working with partners um, within the community so that we could be efficient. So a uh, plan is an excellent sp place to start with a work in order to just uh, outline this is the work that we need to get done and be able to report back and say in you know, a year or two, this is the work that we've done and have um, a clear understanding that these were the goals that we are all agreed upon. Thank you. It's a very organized effort. Any further questions? No. No? Okay. Then uh, with that, we're going to bring it to the public for public comment. Uh, now is the time for any member of the public to address the council uh, on this item. Hello. Welcome. Hey, hello. Good evening. Um, my name is Michelle Kennedy. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Business Services for the SoCal Union Elementary School District. So I'm so happy to be here this evening. I had the opportunity to be part of the core committee that um, put this plan together. And it was a wonderful experience in my 25 years of public education. I've worked for an institution that has a five-year strategic plan, but I've never actually been part of creating one. So this was a great opportunity. And um, I just wanted to let the council know the thoughtfulness and the time that Nikki and her team and the consultant put into doing this and getting a lot of input from all of us on the, the core team. I um, appreciated the effort and I'm here on behalf of the school district as well to let the city council know our strong desire to continue partnerships with the city. Um, one of them I'm very happy about is the one at New Brighton, our after school, New Brighton's after school program uh, is doing very well. The kids seem to be happy. I have the fortune of getting to see the kids out my back window from my office. So that's always a lot of fun. So um, just wanted to let the council know. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other members of the public? Hi, welcome. Hi, I'm Lori Hill. Um, didn't know about this, you know, until late last night. And, um, and um, although I am an art and cultural commissioner, I can't speak on behalf of the commission. I'm not, I don't have the role of the chair. And, um, and the chair just had, you know, just several questions 
um, with regards to Art and Cultural Commission. And thank you, Nikki, for reaching out to me. I, I appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate the kinds of questions that the council asked about the strategic plan. Um, very simply, my governmental career, my 35 years of government, um, started in recreation. And my first job was cost recovery programs. Um, that said, they, they never save anybody any money. Um, they help generate money to cover appropriate costs, and I totally get that, but um, they don't save anybody any money. Um, and also, to the point of working with the school district, um, my first job was with the city of Novato, and they had an amazing working relationship with the school district. We didn't have any facilities of our own, and we programmed the entire community through working with the school district. And um, it was just a dynamite relationship. Um, so there are a lot of things about the strategic plan that I think are, are really good. Um, and Nikki, you've been here for just over a year. Um, you haven't been through too many of the budget processes around here and really the, the, the hard arm wrestling that goes on because there are a lot of competing priorities. Um, what you don't see on your chart up there was, you know, you don't see the added division that is necessary to add to the recreation department in order to support some of the, the, um, the broader encompassing um, activities, particularly with regards to special events. And um, I would like to see a little more dialogue around that. Um, I'm a leader in doing community events, and there are several more like me out there um, that would like to know a little bit more about it because the, the strategic plan just didn't really spell out, you know, what, what was going to be embraced by the, the recreation department and what was going to be, um, you know, left through some other process. So that said, um, thank you for going through this effort. Um, there are a lot of it that I, I would embrace immediately. Um, and at the same time, as a total strategic plan, I think it needs to sharpen its pencil in a few areas, and I would like to have, have and make sure that the stakeholders have had a chance to, to closely review it and comment. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other members of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council for uh, deliberation and a vote. Uh, comments? Member Bator. Sure, I'll start out. Um, first thing I want to say is, Nikki, th this is long overdue. Okay, um, I'm I'm a little put off by some of the comments tonight. Um, I I've seen the city be fractured with the way it delivers uh, recreation for so long, and and. Uh, with the hiring of Nikki, I think we're beginning to fine-tune recreation and realize this is the correct place to pick up things like special events that we dumped on the police department, which doesn't belong in the police department. Police department should be a sign-off to make sure that there's no problem or conflict with those, but those special events should fall under uh, something like recreation. Or they were in the city manager's office, or Larry did it. We just said, Larry, you're the catch-all, fix this, okay, which wasn't the appropriate place. So. I'm excited about the strategic plan. Um, I'm liking that this is picking up events and things that we do that we just didn't have a place to put them and we're putting them all under one great word, umbrella. Um, uh, with regard to um, strategic plan, uh, I remember I got on the, uh, I started, well let's see, before I was on that, I was on a commission, but I, I got on, ended up on the general plan committee because it was the general plan, which what is a general plan? It's like a strategic plan. It's not how we're gonna do anything or how we're gonna pay for it, it's where do we wanna go? And I think what this is is a vision of where do we want Capitola to look at something, just like we had the Begonia Festival on the beach. It's like, wait a minute, the beach is a park. That should be run by parks and recreation, just like when we run junior guards, it's on the beach. And we have artists set up in the Esplanade, it's in the Esplanade Park. So this, to me, just makes common sense about where we should be going. What's gonna come out of this is, is what Nikki's gonna do after we adopt a general plan, or a strategic plan, which says where we wanna go, is how are we gonna get there? And that's gonna be an action plan, and that's gonna be where the money comes in, where ultimately, everything that happens, happens with this body voting to whether they want to endorse something, approve something, move forward with it. Uh, 
when I started, the, my political career in this town was on the parking commission, you know, and that's, we have five or six commissions that I had got into a, a philosophical discussion a few months ago that we I have to remind the commissions because the first thing I did when I started receiving these letters from the Art and Cultural Commission was, commissions serve at the will of the council. Let's not lose sight of that. Even the Planning Commission serves at the will of the council. We appoint them. We, in, we entitle them to do and make decisions about building in the city, and I appreciate all the hours and the diligence that all these commissions put into it. These are people that love what they do. When I was on the Parking Commission, I loved making decisions, but it would all came under the guidance of the council directing them. One good uh, benefit of the Arts Cultural Commission is, is we've tied that to a building fund where they generate hundreds of thousands of dollars that, that the uh, Art and Culture Commission has been able to turn around and, and, and put beautiful art throughout this city. It's one of the most beneficial programs that we have. But nonetheless, it's like, you know, I got into a discussion about, you know, well, we want to uh, refer the, the Arts and Culture Commission to look at something, and it's like, well, we have to ask them. It's like, no, no, they, they work for this council, and, and, you know, you need to be clear about what your role is. And just like when we're up here and we vote on something, our role is to make a decision that we feel is most beneficial. And when, when some comment, Laura, you made a comment about it, you just heard about this. Well, you know, I just heard about this. This is just on the agenda. I read it for the first time. I look at it and go, where are we trying to go? What, what's this all about? And I realize this is a common sense thing for us to take all the loose pieces that are hanging around the city, put them under this umbrella, use them in a place where they appropriately should be because all these things we just say, well, who's, who's gonna do this and who's gonna take care of this? And this to me is where we should go. This is where it belongs. You don't wanna have operations hand happening in the city that somebody in the city manager's office is making the decision one year and then somebody else, somebody else the next year. So I'm excited about this. I think that, the, uh, that we're definitely gonna want input from the Arts and Culture Commission. We're gonna care about you know, what they think about, but to me, the, all the events that happen in the city should be under some, uh, some umbrella. And if it ends up being that that's the recreation department, then that's a perfect place for it. And w everything that happens, you know, every event that is approved to happen in the city comes to this council. We approve the event calendar every year. So it isn't like something happens that we don't have input into but we wanna use our bodies and we wanna be efficient to see that all these different departments, public works, Steve Jesberg should not be working on, you know, whether we're setting up easels in the park, okay? That's not, he should be making sure that the grass is mowed and the sprinklers work and, and that the park is, is capable to handle these operations. But some of the things that we did were probably just not being done in the most efficient way. So I'm taking my hat off to this program. It's long overdue. Um, uh, we, do we need a motion to, what's, what's the recommendation? Is, is there, we need a motion to adopt, it. make a motion to, I'm gonna make a motion to adopt the strategic plan. Second. Thank you. We have a motion, second, continue discussion. Yeah. So, um, I was on the committee and um, when we're coming up with the stakeholder group, I think we missed a beat there, but I have full faith that this will be recovered. Um, and that says a lot about how I feel about Nikki. Um, the reason why I asked the question was, you know, we hired a new person here and they immediately saw that there was something missing. And, you know, if you're gonna be effective in what you're gonna do in any particular effort in your life, having a plan that's structured and organized, and in this case, um, many people were involved in putting this plan together. It's reached out to major sta uh, stakeholders. As you've said, Michelle, you know, it's been successful at New Brighton. It's helping a lot of kids getting more engaged. Leadership is one of the aspects you're pushing. These are good things. We haven't done this. We've neglected this. And now we're going forward in ways that we are going to make positive impacts on a different segment of our population, different demographics of our population. Um, you know, since Kristen and Yvette have come here, we're swinging towards trying to identify how we could reach out to our youth, and we have some money to do it. And I think this is a wonderful, you know, combination, having a plan to do that 
with the recognition and the drive that the city council would like to see carried out. I'm, I'm all for it. Um, I'm not worried that some groups uh, weren't approached initially because I know you're going to do it now. That's how I feel about it. Um, I'd also like to say uh, my first involvement in the city capitola, I was on the recreation committee, and it was just very bland. We didn't do anything. We didn't have a plan. It was just looking at the budget each year. And there was no drive for new programs. There was no uh, outreach to different groups that would potentially want to be involved in creating new things in the recreation department. Nothing, period. So Rich Hill, the last, well, you might know, Lori, Rich Hill, the last city manager said, you know, there's just no use for this. You know, why spend staff time doing it? So um, it was discontinued. Um, so there is a proposal here to explore a new, a new aspect of the committee that would uh, make this strategic plan more meaningful to the people in Capitola. So with this kind of program, with this kind of um, plan looking forward, I think there could be a use for a new committee like that and reaching out to other people in the community that would like to be involved in improving our recreation program. So. Um, it's all positive to me. So thank you for doing this plan. Appreciate it. May I respond? Yes, please. Thank you. I don't see how we can adopt a strategic plan when one of the major stakeholders have not even been asked to participate. Okay, the Art and Coastal Commission has not been presented with this plan given the details of what it means. And it doesn't say to consider or discuss. It says plan for and incorporate the city events into the Parks and Recs Division. So I know some of you care, like the top-down approach. I don't care for that. I think that if you're going to have a plan, you have everyone an opportunity to give their input into it before you pass it. These events are not just loose and floundering around in the city. They're being well run by volunteers at almost no cost to the city. And now you're just going to tell them they're going to come under some other auspices without even hearing from them before you do it. So there's a lot that is good in this plan. But I think that's the one major failing. And I don't see the reason why, in honor to the Art and Cultural Commission volunteers, we don't just delay this so that they can study it, meet with Nikki, talk about it, and give us back their input. There could be some great synergies that come out of that, but you don't know, because there's no specifics in here. So. This is not a guiding principle. It's, it is specific marching orders. Um, so that's the one uh, issue that I have and why I'm not going to support this motion. I think this needs to just be put over. It doesn't start until the fiscal year 2021. There's an opportunity to uh, honor everybody's input who may be impacted by whatever is going to come from this plan. Uh, it's unclear to me. Uh, so um, I'm also concerned about that, that there's no budget projections in this plan. Uh, there's obviously budget implications, but we're adopting something and um, saying, well, the action plan's going to come later with all these dollars attached to it, um, and we may or may not see whether we can fit that into our budget. Well, I think that that's putting uh, the cart before the horse. I think you need to have some sense of what the expenses are going to be before you adopt it. Have staff spend all the time developing now these concepts which have monetary costs to our general fund and have it come back and us realize, oh my word, we have many other priorities. We can't possibly approve these additional staff, either in public works or parks and recs, or if we have a downturn. I just heard that 
about the mall being shut down. We're going to have significant budgetary constraints over the next few years. Uh, but we're adopting a plan that is going to impose additional costs on us without us even knowing what those costs are going to be. So it seems to me worthwhile to spend the time to study it a little bit further. I don't see the need to rush into this plan at this point, and uh, I think it should be fleshed out a little bit more. Um, and um, so I'll just leave it at that. And with that, I'm not going to support the current motion. All right, Mary. Um, we have one more council member who hasn't spoken yet, and then we'll come back around. Thank you. Vice Mayor Brooke. Thank you. Um, you know, I appreciate everyone's input so far. I think I'm, I am actually in agreement with council member story on this one that there, um, all stakeholders should be talked with before <laughs> being included in a plan. I think it's really important that they're, um, that we receive, they receive that kind of opportunity. Um, I believe in plans. I think it's a great idea. I, I, we were in dire need of something like this, but the one element that's missing here is um, receiving feedback from from this group. Um, Council Member Botterf made a really exceptional point that we are the leading force in this. We are the ones who make the decisions and everything comes to us. But with that aside, I think that this group should be given an opportunity to, to give their input because they're clearly laid out in here. Um, what does that mean to them? You've had that uh, public works and the police department had that opportunity and it would only be fair. Um, in regards to the budgetary piece of it, plans are plans. I think it's a five-year plan and a lot can happen and it, that would be a hard piece to really capture. So I don't necessarily n think that that's necessary to add on to a five-year kind of visionary strategic plan. But what I would like to see come back possibly from staff is to examine shifting the dedicated children's fund under the umbrella of the parks and rec department and how that could possibly offset some of those costs we're already funding early education and youth programs that this could be a uh, a way to mitigate some of those incurring or uh, costs that could could be under that program so not necessarily that that's a that we can tie that in but at a later time or in addition to maybe we can see that happen um, that's I and I want to be clear that that's not to supplant the current funding that you guys have this is to enhance and to create additional programming that we see in this plan um, so I'm not in um, I would like to see this come back to us that would be my um, my request here are you making are you making a substitute motion yeah if we can um, have this plan come back after you receive feedback from the Arts and Culture Commission I'll second that I'll you already that. seconded the first motion. I don't believe you can second the second motion, correct? I'll second it. Then. Okay. Yeah. So we have uh, an initial motion and a second. We have a substitute motion and a second also on the floor. Still following procedure as of now? Rules of, okay. I have a question. Yes. So my question was going to be for Nikki. Um, how would you think of putting this off and reaching out to um, an expanded group of stakeholders, uh, specifically the art? And cultural group um, well so I I feel like that ultimately the plan is the the intent is for me to start that work right um, I yes they were not part of the core team um, but there there was communication about those events and what I would do if this was approved, ultimately what I would do is begin that work, s reach out, talk about this process, evaluate what makes the most sense for the city and the recreation division. Um, so I, I feel like that that work, the intent of that work is, w is what would happen um, one way or another. I have a, another question, um, city manager. So. Ultimately, we approve whatever happens in this city, including the budget. We have a recreation budget, so if there's anything new that comes out of the strategic plan, it's going to be proposed in that budget. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's a fair characterization. Okay. Um, the other question is, um, the city council has approved art and cultural events, 
and there's a whole list of um, uh, events done by the uh, s um, the chamber and the events done by the BI and, and the you know the foundation. So these things have already been approved. I don't know anything about that. We keep reapproving them every year. Wh what's the process? It seems to me that they've been going on. <laughs> <laughs> forever in a sense you know what, how do we deal with that so i'm going to answer your question in two parts the first one is you know i guess i guess i think a, a key thing for us all to understand is is and you know it may just be a question of wording i think in this policy is th this policy isn't proposing to do anything this policy or this strategic plan when we're talking about these new collaborations anything we're not already doing so this is basically taking you know we have a person in the city manager's department who provides support to art and cultural maybe they should live in recreation we have a person <clears throat> in the police department who oversees and quarterbacks the uh, special event permits maybe that should live in recreation so this isn't a question of doing something new it's a question of kind of where we put the bodies and how we organize them to provide the best overall capacity and support for those different entities. So this isn't a question of recreation is going to like take over the old Begonia Festival and organize it. That that's not at all. Just so we're clear about what we're talking about. To go back and answer your question a little bit more forcefully or directly, you asked about this history of the special events. The so special events come in two flavors. We have these minor special events, which staff can approve, and those are you know relatively small events that have fewer attendees. And then we have the majors, and those are all the events that we know. The majors, if they don't have changes, can be reapproved by staff every year, year to year. We do an annual report in November. We summarize, here's what happened this year, and then at that point, council members can say, and we identify if there was any issues with the uh, special events. At that point, then you can pull a special event and say, you know, fireworks this year were a real problem. We have to take a hard look at that special event permit, at which point it would come back to you. And then any new major special event would come to the council. Yeah, so ultimately it's up to us. And as yeah. far as I'm concerned right now, is it true that these events are standing fine? If there's any changes, you'll come back to the city council. That's correct. Okay. So um, I want to give my faith to the process here. And... I fully appreciate the effort, and I have total faith that it will be carried out. Um, I do not think that this is a city that's going to ignore the other aspects that are strategic partners in our community. And I think this program is going to start reaching out to all of them to s try to see how they fit in. But on the other hand, I, I go with the sentiment of Sam in Yvette. If we take a period of time to reach out to the art and cultural and the other groups that are putting on events in this city, would that hurt this process? Would, would this be something that would like dampen the effort? Do you, do you feel that it would have benefit that you could incorporate into your strategic plan and, and reflect some of the issues that might come up? Okay. Yeah, sure, I, I think that I think, yeah, I think the intent of that work is, is to get that piece done, so, yeah. Okay, so what was the substitute motion? Postpone the um, adoption of the strategic plan until it has been presented to the Arts and Cultural Commission. You know, I'd like to add an amendment to that, and that, well, that, and that was the piece about the youth funding. Mm -hmm. so. That staff would come back with yeah, well, that at a later time. They'll come back, yeah. Okay. So I, I'd like a timeline on this. Okay. Uh, a question so of clarification. Can can an amendment be made to a motion that yes. he's already seconded yeah. a different motion? Y yes. I just it can clarify. be a friendly okay. amendment. So the person who made the original motion would have to agree to the amendment. You're, you made the substitute motion. The person who made it. No, made right. It. So. Okay. It, oh, yeah. Would your amendment be to the, it would be to the substitute motion, yeah, right? To the substitute. Right. So, Council Vice Mayor Brooks would need to accept the friendly amendment. I assume that's what you're offering right. is a friendly amendment to the substitute motion. We would then vote on if if that's accepted, we'd vote on the substitute motion with the amendment. If it's not accepted, we would vote on the substitute motion with that. Right. Well, if it's not accepting, you wanted to make another substitute motion, we might vote on that. We vote last motion to first. Okay. Thank you. So, 
I mean, you know we have three motions on the floor before you need to start voting. So we're getting there. I, I hear what you're saying, Jacques, and I, th I, I too would like to see it come back as quickly as possible. I don't set the agenda; our mayor does. But I'd love. I mean, I'm sure Nikki will be on the phone as soon as possible with with the Arts and Cultural Commission well, to have so a discussion. So that would two months. I don't want to set a time because I don't set the agenda. I don't think I'm. I, I'm, I don't know what's coming up but, on the agenda, but I, okay. I would favor it coming back. I think Art and Cultural is meeting in April, so I think it would probably be either a second April or a May meeting that we could bring it back. Okay. Well, yeah, we so actually I don't have a meeting March 10th. Okay. Oh, and we have a retreat. Has that been scheduled, Blake? One second. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the retreat's been scheduled. Um, it was a request to put it on the April um, agenda by someone who wasn't going to be I said we'd put it on a future agenda someone had requested it be April because they were not going to be in attendance okay. and that's the only reason it happened and, and I, I do want to make it clear it was, it was my oversight not bringing it to the the Art and Cultural Commission we actually had a representative and I just didn't do that and, and let me be clear that I'm not asking Nikki to go to arts and, and they get to just say I don't want to be part of this I want to be clear that this is just presentation to them receive some feedback some clarity on on what this is because again I'm fully behind this this plan I think we just have to do our due diligence and give them an opportunity to be presented with the information since they're in in it so I just want to be clear about that okay well I, I'd like a time definite and um, Larry can you suggest well, so uh, most likely if, if, if it's approved it'll be on, or it'll be discussed at the April meeting which is the second um, Tuesday um, I don't have that date okay. unfortunately. So two months yes okay just, if I, just, there's, there's uh, not going to be a March meeting. there is but March it, someone that um, was very interested in is not going to be there and has asked it to be postponed so. okay be before we move forward I just want to um, I, I just want to um, acknowledge first um, have you accepted or not the amendment to your motion, to your substitute motion. No, I, I oh, didn't oh, make I needed, it yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's no motion on. Okay. I, it, we're still. That's fine. Then we're still in it. discussion, and Councilmember Botchorf has been waiting patiently um, to have an opportunity to speak while we've all been kind of going back and forth. So I'm going to ask us to to come to him now, and then we will continue our discussion. So unusual of him to hold himself <laughs> back. What's going on here? I just have a question a of, cue. of Councilman Story, and that is, who do you consider stakeholders in this situation? And you said we want to reach out to stakeholders. Uh, obviously, I, I, the Art and Culture Commission is one. Who, who else do you consider stakeholders? Well, it's, uh, on the only one. Um, well, there there are many stakeholders referenced in this. Uh, many of them were part of the core team, so they had an opportunity to participate. Um, uh, the Art and Cultural Commission I view to be the key stakeholder, which did not have an opportunity as a group to participate and this seems to have a major impact on them um, so to me that's the one I'm concerned about now the other I mean the two other that are referenced are public works and the police department but those are internal affairs of the city the city manager can coordinate um, um, the most efficient way among all the departments about how they should be organized, how they should be delivered. Um, and I don't necessarily perceive that that needs to have a policy strategic plan. Um, so um, now I would normally maybe like to hear from the police chief about his feelings about this. Uh, but I assume that the city manager is gonna be representing his interests. He's not here tonight um, and as well um, that he's representing the interests of public works. So the key stakeholders who are community individuals who are impacted by this, that's the piece I think they need to have an opportunity to hear this um, and to be able to um, at least be introduced to it uh, to, uh, and maybe they will have all come together and realize that there can be some great benefits here that they will embrace. But I think there needs to be an opportunity for that to happen. And, and I, I'd, I'd just like to make a comment, thank, thank, that. thank you. Uh, Sam, I thank you for that 
uh, position because I, I need to understand that. And and I think what um, well again what what we come down to is is a fundamental di disagreement here uh, on on philosophy. And and the number one thing I want to make clear here is this is not an attack on the Art and Cultural Commission. Okay, this is about an organizational chart is really all this is about. This is the city manager meeting with his staff, that being public works, uh, community uh, development, all of his staff to come up, how do we run this city better? And I'm sure that, that Nikki just didn't come to us and say, this is a plan that I want to do because I came up with it all on my own. This is probably something that came off in a staff meeting that came as a presentation about recreation needs to expand, we need to to bring our city together so that things function more smoothly. It was definitely awkward for the police department to run events, and I believe this is a plan for us to move forward. That's why it's a strategic plan. And, it, and, and following when you, when you come up with something where it's gonna go, that's when you talk to people and say, how are we gonna do it? How are you gonna be impacted? But, uh, but you know, I wanna remind the council that, that eight months ago, this council abolished the parking commission without even talking to them. This is a commission that serves for the city. I didn't do that. Okay, then 12 months ago, or, th or 16 months ago, this council abolished the parking commission without talking to them. Commissions are valuable to the city and, and, and they serve a function. And, and, and I do not want to minimize, I'm gonna tell you right now, uh, I am in great awe of the, of the Art and Culture Commission and how they continue to provide things for this for this city and how they continue to grow but but like i said one thing that they have that no other commission has is they have a budget that, that's funded by by continuing revenue and and the thing is is we're not trying this is not an attack on uh, and I, I believe in my heart that not one thing different will happen to the art and culture commission other than then they may have someone that they report to that finally has that has a boss but um that's why I'm here. I'm trying to move this process forward to where we can en enable you know, our recreation director to meet with these people, find out what their concerns are, and then come back to us with an action plan instead of realizing that this is what our job is, is to lead the city. And so I'm, I'm at a loss why we can't move forward with this. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, take an opportunity, if I may, to say a couple <laughs> words. Um, I would first like to say Nikki, since you've been here, I've seen incredible improvements in our uh, recreation department. The after school program, the food truck event was really exciting and I've wanted to see some kind of food truck event in Capitola since forever. So you've done amazing work and I know that there's only gonna be more amazing work that you're doing here. I can't thank you enough for what you've done for, for, our, for, that, for your department and for the city as a whole. Um, I share several of the concerns with Vice Mayor Brooks and with Councilman Story. Um, I don't think this is a bad plan. I think this is a good plan, but I am concerned about moving forward when some stakeholders haven't been included. The Art and Cultural Commission would be the um, most apparent one to me that, that needs to be acknowledged. Um, I also received uh, comments from members of the BIA who were concerned about what does this mean for permits for the sip and stroll or for, and I, and I didn't have answers for them. There weren't answers that I knew, there weren't answers in, in the recreation plan so I would um, I would almost I venture to, to suggest that there would be a public meeting in regard to this that other business owners that other people who come to get permits or other uh, special event th that there's more opportunity for more individuals who will be impacted or could be impacted to at the very least as mentioned receive a presentation ask some questions and say this is what we think about that um, again, I don't think this is an opportunity for anyone to say, sorry, I don't like it, that's not ever gonna happen. I'm, I, would be, I would be ready to approve this if I felt that the Art and Cultural Commission and other stakeholders had a chance to at least weigh in. And then even if they came to us and said, I don't like it, I could at least know that they had had an opportunity, that they'd given their feedback, that they felt that they were heard. Um, so that that does concern me now I would like us to consider how we would want to move forward because we could consider sitting here for another half hour going back and forth with point and counterpoint with each other I think we all agree that Nikki does a great job our recreation department is fantastic and we're looking forward to eventually 
coming to a recreation strategic plan that we can all agree on and vote for. However, I don't think that we should continue. I am of the personal belief that continued debate is not going to get us any further than we already are, and I'm ready to call the question. Call the question. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second, and a substitute motion and a substitute second. Yes. So there was a request to amend. I, I don't know if that was a request for a friendly that amendment of really, the substitute. That was never made. Accepted. No. Well, no I, well, she didn't accept it. Uh, she didn't accept it. I, I, I just yeah. want to put a time limit in. She didn't yeah, accept and she it. didn't accept oh, that amendment to her motion. I didn't. There's not enough clarity for that. Okay. I don't okay. Think that so possible. the council should first vote on the substitute motion. Okay. Can we get a roll call vote, What's please? The, repeat, uh, repeat the substitute repeat. motion, please. The so substitute motion is to postpone the vote on the strategic plan until such time as the Arts and Cultural Commission has had a chance to hear a presentation about the plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Roll council member story. With the addition of the staff will come back regarding the dedicated children's fund. Um, oh, I thought that was pulled and going to be in the budget I thought that was process. Too. It was that com are you comfortable with bringing that back at budget time? Budget or does it maybe? I don't think there's any action required at this point. So I would be bringing that back as part of the budget. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Council member story. Aye. Council member Brooks. Aye. Council member Bottorf. No. Council member Bertrand. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Okay, so that moots the first motion. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Hold on a second. I need. I need a break. Sure. Uh, we are going to take a two-minute, three-minute break, and then uh, for bathroom and water and deep breaths, and then we will return. And chocolate. And chocolate. Oh, there's M and M's in this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You don't like them, right? No. Thank <laughs> you. 
city services and then the other city services. Go on. <laughs> All right. Are we ready to return? You can return. Oh. All right. We are going to um, <coughs> we're going to co uh, continue our meeting now with item ten C. Item 10C, uh, consider approval of emergency contract for repairs to the damaged wharf hoist area. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So quick background, just as I'm sure you're aware, on January 1st, two pilings uh, broke under the small boat hoist on the wharf. Emergency work was completed at that time in order to prevent the hoist and the uh, surrounding structure from catastrophic failure. Um, without that emergency work, which we completed days after that, um, we would have lost the, uh, the, the hoist and the pad it sits on and a good portion of the structure underneath the wharf. Um, but that work that we completed in January has to be considered uh, temporary in nature. It is no way uh, meant to be a long-term fix. Um, the, the structure itself is still in jeopardy, especially in a storm of additional failure. In addition, the hoist uh, is inoperable at, until repairs are made, and it prov um, provides a significant impact to the uh, boat and bait shop uh, on the wharf. Just a reminder, this is what that failed area looks like. These are the two piles that are supposed to be straight up and down that are kind of bent right now. <laughs> and you can see the sag in the wharf underneath. This is the crane right here, and you can see it sagged. So even though we have stabilized this, that sag remains as it is today. Um, we've just prevented it from failing uh, completely for the moment. So engineers from Moffat Nickel, who are, are wharf engineers and power engineering, have been working trying to how best to resolve this problem. Um, when we've done pile replacements in the past, it's been a pretty simple process. The pile breaks. The wharf doesn't settle a great deal. They're able to go out there with a pile driver, drive a new pile, put it under the, the existing structure. Um, there's no 10 tons of, of crane and ballast sitting underneath it. So it, it was a pretty straightforward and an and easy fix. Not necessarily uh, economic or cheap, but it was straightforward. The presence of the hoist has, has changed the complexity quite a bit. So like I said, engineers from Moffat Nickel and staff from Power Engineering we, and, and myself have gone through several iterations on how best to make these permanent repairs. Um, as part of this process, we completed a dive inspection of the broken piles and some of the surrounding piles uh, January 21st of this year. And what that determined is that it would be possible to do a sleeve over the broken piles, bring them up to about three feet from where the, uh, the deck sits today, and then actually use a jack to jack the um, uh, deck back into place and then seal up that jack uh, as part of the pile. So we've looked at three options, um, and due to the cost which I'm sharing with you the first time, and I apologize it wasn't part of the agenda report, but I received these costs yesterday. Um, so we're, we're kind of going through this together at this point. So option one is to sleeve the broken piles with a plastic high-density polyethylene pipe and insert a steel rebar in concrete to create a concrete pile. Um, this project has about a five to six week lead time to get all the materials. So let's get everything together. The HDP pipe is readily available to get the rebar uh, put together and assembled in a way that can be slid into the pile is, is probably the longest lead time. Um, this 
repair uh, does not require a pile driver to be on site. Option two, which the contractor developed because he thought it would be could be most efficient, is actually to drive new wood piles. This was a surprise to me because I thought we were saving money by not having to um, mobilize a crane. But as it turns out, sleeving the, the piles requires a diver to be in the water, and you spend about $7,000 a day to have a diver in the water. So that's where we ended up eating costs that we might not have necessarily understood uh, when we undertook these repair options. So the cost for driving new wood piles is $166,000. Unfortunately, there's an eight to 10 week lead time to get new wood piles. Um, they have to be, they don't store them in, they need to be um, treated so they d um, don't uh, deteriorate and rot uh, in that environment. Um, they don't store them that way, so it's, th it's a very long lead time. The third option, which is originally what we thought we would be going with, was to, instead of using wood piles or the HDP piles, was to line, uh, slip line the broken piles with the fiberglass pile. Um, those, you know, fiberglass pile is what we intend to use uh, for the upcoming rehabilitation project when we widen the wharf. Um, this project has a six to eight week lead time, uh, mainly again because we're waiting for the, they don't store and stock fiberglass piles, so they have to be made. I think they're made in North Carolina, and so get them made, shipped out here, um, but it's only six to eight weeks. But that has a cost of $181,000. Um, but this one, like I mentioned, is consistent with our rehabilitation plans um, in that the fiberglass piles, when um, the first phase, you know, we're widening the, the, tr the trestle of the wharf in the second phase when funding is available um, several years from now was to raise the um, head of the wharf where the buildings are and these piles could be extended at that time to that new elevation. So it is, we do have a consistency there. Since we're kind of reviewing these costs for the first time, I, I did speak with the contractor and the engineer today about the costs of were developed and um, some of the other options are to uh, drive fiberglass piles so rather than slip lining they would actually just buy new piles uh, fiberglass piles and drive them like they would a wood pile this again would be consistent um, they didn't work up a cost but it would be somewhere between the cost of the wood piles which are cheaper and installing them uh, as a slip line which was the 181 I put 180 here um, somewhere in between, say, $175,000 for that project. Um, and a third project is to actually sit down and, and try and refine the cost a little bit more with the, um, in, with the uh, contractor, excuse me, to uh, about the fiberglass um, lining, sleeving with the fiberglass piles. Um, our engineer, Moffat Nickel, has done that project on several other um, piers along the coast and found that the, it was more cost effective than perhaps power is used to. Um, so we could sit down and make sure we under, un, understand those costs a little bit more. As a part of this, we could also consider that, um, you know, two of the piles are underneath the, the hoist and absolutely need to be repaired. Third one is uh, right outside of the restaurant. Um, while it'd be, it, it definitely needs repair. Um, we, it could be potentially deferred at this point. Um, again, we, with the fiberglass piles, we'd have a six to week lead time, and you know, we'd potentially have a cost savings from the estimated $181,000. So what we're asking you tonight is to adopt a resolution declaring an emergency with authorized as procurement of services without giving notice for bids Excuse the typo there. Pursuant to the public contract code 22050, um, and that action would require a four-fifths vote of the council. As part of that action, the asking to authorize the city manager to enter into a contract with Power Engineering Construction with the following: using fiberglass piles, which are consistent with the future rehabilitation project. And the reason I'm pointing that out is, with this approval, we can get those ordered tomorrow or you know, early next week, so we get that six to eight week delivery time going as quickly as we can while we're finalizing exactly 
if we're going to drive them or we're going to slip line them and what's the most efficient way to use those piles and i'm asking for a um, cost not to exceed one hundred eighty thousand dollars at this time that's my report and i'd be happy to answer any questions thank you any questions council member botworth option 2b was for three pilings that would be the one in the restaurant and the two under the <coughs> hoist correct thank you council member Bertrand, you had a question um relative strength fiberglass wood they are equivalent um there's probably more strength in the fiberglass in that they don't do not erode and corrode or um aren't subject to the environment as much as the wood piles are so, so they they, they will certainly last a, a lot longer and won't deteriorate over time like the wood piles do so um one thing i've often wondered about sleeves and concrete and all that sort of stuff there's a motion you know with flexes and stuff like that so would there be any um, forces generated because one flexes the different way than ones that's wood or something like that? And that so the, the concrete piles, if they get driven, are not filled with concrete. So they ha actually have a little bit more flexibility than the, in the, than the wood piles do. Um, when we, if we do the slip lining, then they would get filled with concrete, and that's more for a horizontal um, or vertical structural element. Uh, I've talked to the engineer about, you know, different periods of motion for the different piles. And if, even if the concrete were to crack because they would be a stiffer pile than the wood piles, you would still have the vertical um, support you needed. And the concrete, and again, the, the fiberglass piles are structurally equivalent without any concrete to them to the uh, wood piles. And the one near the rest, that's the one that's been out there a long time? Correct. It has a, a, a strong <coughs> back, as we call it, over the top of it now. Okay. Council Member Story. Yeah. Um, Steve, will the 180 cap work? When, when I noticed the sleeve with fiberglass um, was estimated at 181, 538. Yeah, I think um, I anticipate that we're going to be able to find some savings in there. Um, sure. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm very comfortable with that. All right. Uh, if now is time for public comment. If there's any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item, now would be the time. Seeing none. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll speak for Frank, if I may. He wants it done as quickly as possible. He needs his hoist back. We all do. Okay. We're going to bring it back to council for uh, deliberation and a vote. Are there any comments? Councilmember Botcher. Uh, if you can bring back the slide for option 2B, Steve. Yeah, I, I'm going to make a motion. We uh, authorize staff to proceed with option 2B, three pylons. So you want to do all three for cool. sure? That's three, yeah. Because three did consider possibly eliminating the one pile out by the restaurant. But I, You know what? If we're going to bring the machinery out there and we're going to put it in. Why put it off? Because if something else happens with that strong back, we lose something else, then we're in a jam again, okay? If we're okay. here to fix it, so I get all three can be done for 180000 Yes. Correct. And then my motions for option 2B. Second. We have a motion and a second. Council Member Story. Clarification. I thought you wanted the option to either drive them or sleeve them. Do you want to drive them? No. Our, our recommendation was to give us the flexibility because I think our engineer right. has estimated that option. Well, that's option. 2B. 3B. 3B, which was the sleeving them should have been about half of that. And so we were trying to work with the contractor to figure out where the costs were. So that was why we, we were thinking, we're hesitant about driving the piles because we were thinking that it was about 180 and we were hoping that the sleeving option should be around 100. The bid came in higher. So we were gonna try to, we, our, what we're asking the council to do is give us the authority to go up to 180. If we can't get the sleeving option down, then we may need to drive, okay. but. Okay, that, 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 that wasn't clear in my, in my motion, Sam, and I, okay. I appreciate the comment there. I, I'm under the impression that, that everything is around 180,000 because I don't see another number here that says that it's going to be 100. What scares me is, is like other conversations we've had with, with something like maybe wires, is that all of a sudden we think it's $100,000 and then the, 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 the sleeving is 150. My premise is our ultimate goal, what we want from the wharf, is fiberglass piles. And, and if we drive three now, that's three less we have to drive at some other time than some other replica. So what I'm going to say is that if you're not able to save at least uh, one-third the cost, 
So I would say I'm going to give you a limit. If, if it's more than $120,000, then drive all three. Is that clear? I need to. I need to. My, mo my motion is to adopt. Uh, is uh, just don't give an option. Just say. Well, because there's, I, I can't can't give it because it's not here. My option is say I will. I make a motion for option three B unless the cost exceeds one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and then, in that case, go to option two B because option three B is only driving two, and option three B would drive three. And there was a second to that? So tech, under 3B, we, uh, the option was we could eliminate one of the piles, the one out in the strong back. You're only going to try to but do it. But we can do three. If we can do three for under the 100 and whatever the cost is to drive them, we would still prefer to do three. Right. I, I, I would like to give you the authorization to do 3B, but you're not giving me a cost. Okay, 3B right. says you're only going to do two, and if I'm saying if it's going to yeah. cost me 120 to do two, then I will pay 180 to do three. Right. So that's why can, we're asking for flexibility to try and, and work what with I'm the contractor. You, if you can bring a price. I'm, my option, my motion is approve option 2B if it's less than $120,000. Okay. If it's only two, that's fine. If it if you cannot get those for done for less than $120,000, then the motion goes to option 2B, which is 180 for three. If you come back and the bid's $130,000, you're going to go to 2B. If you get it for $100,000 and you proceed with anything less than 120. If I can do all three with the slip lining for under 180, can we proceed with that way? Yeah, but why not drive them for 180? It may be cheaper to slip line three than to drive three. That's what we're trying to figure out. That's what we're still working with the contractor on. Okay, C clarify to Paul, me. And I apologize else. for the confusion. The difference between slip lining and and <coughs> and and uh, driving. So when you drive a pile, you you take it and um, put it not over an existing um, pile. It goes next to the existing pile. You drive it into the mud and sand, probably 10 to 15 feet um, until it hits refusal. So it, it's it's a longer pile. It is structurally sound from one top to the bottom. The slip lining project, what we're doing is we're utilizing the pile that has broken, but it was still viable um, down at the dirt level or the sand level. Um, that's why we did the dive inspection. We determined that that stub, if you will, is still a viable st structural element that can be used as a foundation. So we would slip line and probably c create a three to five foot interface between the fiberglass pile and the wood pile that's remaining and then um, use that as a structure from then on and then we'd fill it with concrete so we have a continuous column connection between right, the so our new fiberglass pile is based on a wood f pile Foundation. that's already in the right. ground right which may or may not have a, a lifespan it's no. structurally sound right now and they don't deteriorate as quickly on, in the mud I mean the, the engineer is the one who said this is a very viable one and I, and I trust Moffat and Nickel in this regard you know, it, 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 it's it's very hard for us to bid on something when there's not a cost I, because I'm, I'm trying to it. analyze something and I don't have a number. And, and, and it, it makes it very awkward. Um, so in option 3B here, let me try this again, is, uh, as <coughs> city manager said, both the engineer and I were surprised the cost of sleeving with the fiberglass piles was as expensive as it was. So I was trying to find a way, um, because the costs were so significant, to do still the sleeving and find a, w a more economical way for the city to proceed and get the, the hoist back open. Um, I'm whether yield to council member story, he's got some comments. Okay, so just if I can finish quickly, um, I think we can work the cost with the engineer, with the contractor as we go through the project a little bit more, where we can still sleeve all three projects for under the $180,000. That's one of my goals. If we can't, then we would go back to driving the three piles, which we know would be less than $180,000. Um, I apologize, we don't have all the costs. Like I said, sure. it's, it's, it's kind of, as an emergency project, we're, we're, we're going as fast as we can at this point. Council Member Story? Yeah, thank you. Uh, if we sleeve them, 
Will that retain its integrity um, when we do the war rehabilitation? In other words, they can just stay as they are sleeved and fit in with the rest of the that rehabilitation work? Yes, yes. especially out here because okay. part of the rehabilitation doesn't, we're not raising or changing the um, structure at the head of the wharf where the overall three of these piles are located. Right, okay. Okay, well, hearing that, I, I think that we should give them the option of either driving them or, or sleeving them with fiberglass uh, and at the best bid that they can possibly get, but give them the option to make that determination at the time. I'm sure that they'll make the right choice. So a maximum of 180 using fiberglass? Oh, right. The, yeah, they, they requested a maximum of right. 180. We know we but can I don't, uh, there's already a motion. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't know what the motion is. Yeah. That's what I'm trying well, to the get. motion was for 2B. I made a motion. Uh, right, uh, can I withdraw the motion? Yes. I withdraw the motion. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll make a new motion that um, we um, authorize staff uh, to, um, oh, actually, that's option 3B, right, to either uh, drive them or sleeve um, the, um, um, pile or the pilings, yes. Uh, with a cost not to exceed 180,000, um, and you know, and if they can get three for that figure, great, go for three. And I would add to the motion, if I may, if I may suggest that you add to the motion that you also um, I adopt the resolution, which includes a declaration of emergency of there, of course. and authorizing procurement services without giving notice. Yes, so that's included verbatim. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Can I just ask a clarifying question? I think, do we need a second before we continue discussion? Okay, we need a second before we can continue discussion. Do we have a second? Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Discussion continues. Um, regarding the timeline, there was two different timelines out there depending on the options moving forward. Either we drive them or we slip cover the them. The option was, the timelines were more if we were using wood piles had an eight to 10 week lead time. The fiberglass piles have a six to eight week. Okay. And we're committing to the fiberglass as part of the motions, I understand it. And so that's the timeline we'd be looking okay. at. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, because this needs a four fifth vote, I'm assuming a roll call would be best. Let's do a roll call. Council Member Story. Aye. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Bator? Aye. Councilmember Bertrand? Aye. And Mayor Ber <laughs> Boy, I'm sorry I'm doing that tonight. Aye. <laughs> ah, thank you. It's been a long Holiday. It's been a long one. No worries. Uh, we're going to move on. Far from 100%. Thank you. Um, item 10D, introduce an ordinance amending portions of Municipal Code Title II, <clears throat> administration to update and clarify various sections. <laughs> various sections. I'm doing the report and Jamie's doing the tech. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Once you have it open, I can open it here. Okay, good evening. We are returning tonight um, following up on direction that was given to us at a previous meeting in January looking to change and update some areas within Title II administration. Uh, we asked for direction from three items um, at that time. The process, um, amending the process for removing a planning commission member and council added mayor removal at that time. Um, referring items to an advisory body and uh, whether an advisory body chair should still have the ability to place items on a council agenda. And the proposed ordinance reflects your direction on those and we'll go through those specifically. And then um, we also have a number of other cleanups. So the first um, appointment gives two options. So either the person who, the council member who made the appointment can remove a planning commissioner or a majority of the council can also um, vote to remove a planning commissioner. You are leaning toward four, but ask us to write it, come back and make sure what size majority you want. So right now it's three to three or four 
um, council members to remove a commissioner. So Here. our our suggestion for tonight is probably work these things. At the end of the day, we're going to need a motion to approve the, or, the the first reading, pass the first reading of the ordinance. And I think rather than, I think maybe try to work this thing out, and then if the council can just agree, then once you've worked it out, that we would pass the first reading subject to the direction given in the interim steps. It seems like maybe the easiest way to go. So my recommendation would be, if you're comfortable with that as an approach, that we would just tackle this now, get a motion a second, pass this, get sort of the, the items we still need feedback on, then present the rest of the ordinance, and then we would uh, ultimately pass the whole ordinance for our first reading. That makes sense to me. Is there a general consensus? After we do questions and public? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Uh, in that case, uh, we will bring this to council questions. No? Uh, bring it to public? Yes. The, the question is just on this Just on question. this. Mm -hmm. Actually, it also applies to mayoral removal. Mm -hmm. We need a, a determination of whether it's a supermajority or a majority. So we're going to deal with uh, 212020 and... There's two. Yes. <laughs> yep. And it's an, and it's uh, just next slide. There we go. And yeah. So so maybe we get feedback on these two. I, okay. th these were the two parts where we needed feedback. Alternatively, we can just go through and do it all at once. I thought I was making it simple, but if you take individual motions throughout, you probably need to go out for public <laughs> comment multiple times. But if you just discuss it and then do the whole thing in one fell swoop at the end, you don't need to go out for public comment multiple times. Okay. It's up to the mayor. I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so the question right now is three or four. Yes. That's, yes. that's that it. That's, that's, it. that's yeah. it. Cool. Yes. Let's discuss. I say three. Oh, I'm sorry. Strike that. I say four. <laughs> <laughs> I'm simple. I'll say three. <laughs> um, for discussion. Just for discussion. Okay. So can I don't. Can I make a motion? Can I just? Can we just make a? Can I just move? because we've discussed this at the last meeting and it was coming back so can I just make put it on the table so if you so if the discuss? council is taking action which is making a motion a, acting on a motion you need to receive public comment on that we were just having a discussion there. oh I was mm -hmm. like saying like I like three. Oh, okay <laughs> it's like a discussion. usually if there's an item that requires multiple <coughs> points of input from the council you could just go through the whole thing yes. decide what you want to do along the way and then at the end take public comment Okay. I'm ready for it to go to public comment so I can make a motion. You guess you're done with discussion? <laughs> I will bring... Okay. Well, she's got to go to public comment real quick. Yeah. Okay, let's bring this to public comment. Is there any member of the public that would like to address the council on these items? Seeing none, we bring it back to the council <laughs> for a motion. I'd like to make a motion that um, for the planning commission, I feel that we should do a four... Um, vote on that I feel like a, to the to removal of a planning commissioner which has a more finality there's it's final they lose their position they can no longer come back in regards to, to the mayor I think three um, it should be three because they're still considered a voting member there's no really finality it's not like they're no longer a council member they just simply are no longer mayor so I would again my motion would be four for planning commission three for the mayor we have a motion do we have a second I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Let's do a roll call vote for this. Discussion. Discussion. Sure. My apologies. Yeah, I, I, I just feel like I want to make a comment because it is. Uh, Please. I, yes. I, 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 you know, I, I read in the minutes here that are in the in the staff report it says there was we were leaning one way or the other. I don't remember we were leaning. I thought it was a quite vigorous conversation. But <laughs> it was a very vigorous. Yeah, conversation. but I don't remember that we were leaning. But it, but anyway, I, and the only point I want to bring up is that I, I go back to my point. The reason because now we have three on one and four on the other, and I, my point is still the same: is that based on our on the Brown Act, uh, that two people can still talk and form a coalition and block something here. And, and that's allowed. And then when, by making it a supermajority, you allow that to, to happen. Whereas, you know, if you wanted something to take place, it would actually take, you know, three independent votes to remove a planning commissioner. And by making it four, two people could talk and form a coalition and block that action. And, and I, 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 I just think that that's, um, 
an abuse of the Brown Act. So for that reason, I, I, I feel compelled that three votes for, for both is, uh, is warranted. Is that a motion? Or is that no, just no, a that discussion? Was a, no, it was a comment. It was oh, a okay. comment. <coughs> I just wanted to make that My comment. apologies. It's been yeah, the motion's already on the floor. Yes. And with a second. With a second. Any further discussion? Okay, let's do a roll call vote on this one, please. Councilmember Story. Aye. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Bator. No. Councilmember Bertrand. No. And uh, Mayor Peterson. No. So the only option is three and three. <laughs> Shall we try that again? Would you <laughs> like four to make four. That motion? <laughs> I'd like to make a motion that uh, three required for both uh, removal of mayor and planning commissioner. Second. Any further discussion? Okay, let's do another roll call vote, please. Okay. Council Member Story? No. Council Member Brooks? No. Council Member Bator? Aye. Council Member Bertrand? Aye. And Mayor Peterson? Aye. That's about where we were. That's why I was three four this time. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. All right. <coughs> so do we need to make a motion for all the other items? No, there was no question on this. <laughs> We're just yeah, there aren't questions. Do you want to get an overview? Do you want to get the rest of the presentation on the other items well, that I'm are sorry. in there? I'm confused. Um, I think we're all confused. Right. We'll do it quickly. <laughs> Those are the only ones that there the direction was. Oh, we, we wanted it. We wanted further direction. Yes, okay. we wanted further direction. Um, the other item, and that's, yes. Well, I, I had a question about the bonding item. I don't know if we're ready for that or. No, we're gonna go through them all. Oh, we are. Okay. okay. Real wait. quick, uh, placing the item on the agenda. Uh, you did decide to remove um, the uh, ability of a commission chair to place an item on the agenda, which gives them more power than you guys had. Next one is referrals. Jamie, referrals. Um, this is the new item uh, that we are going to ask um, for a motion and then a referral would come up on an agenda with a staff report um, before an item was sent to a commission. These last group these are the um, more simple they were listed in the staff report last time and quickly discussed and are reflected in it um, we had old references for state law uh, nobody else has or has policy adoption in code uh, appeal hearing just clarified the order uh, meeting time and place currently the way it's written we should be having our November meeting the day after Thanksgiving not doing that um, public comment we there was something about you could be have preference if you notified the clerk that has been removed uh, all reference to the redevelopment agency has been deleted um, and then employee bond language um, replacing the bond with a crime insurance policy and the recommendation is to <coughs> approve first reading and council member story you had a question about the bonding requirement it, it is city manager uh, Goldstein <laughs> has a lot to say about bonding. <laughs> That's good, because mm, yes, he does. I have a very poignant question. Um, <laughs> we did so much research on this. That's right. We, know, we, we have no idea. <laughs> we went way down the rabbit hole, the two of us. <laughs> I, th I think I recall some of that. But, but my question is um, concerning government code section three six five one eight. I didn't really read in there that it provided for an alternative of using a, a, a crime insurance policy. Is that so? Is that provided in some other? It is. Okay, that's oh all I. Oh gosh, yeah. Remember? Yeah, give me give me a second. Yeah, th this was the problem. <laughs> that the bonding requirements are in multiple sections of the government code. Okay, no, you don't need to go down that rabbit hole. I just I want. <laughs> we, we well, just thing is. <laughs> it is. It's a separate <laughs> section. I think it's like one seven something. Let me see if I can still find it in my Westlaw without having to look it up. Poor Ben Thompson yeah. still here, recording this. He's ready for us to be. It's a four digit. 
for the little rush. Okay. Stunt your piano. I know. <laughs> I know. We need we need fill music or something here. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> I told them I just take full faith and confidence in there. I've got it here. I'm almost there. <laughs> oh, you beat everyone? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. so. You did? Can you oh, if I can find his original a one. Slow internet connection right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who's going to win? <laughs> oh, wait, that's the template. I'm clicking on the wrong thing. Sorry. Mm. It's all right. That's okay. Good effort. Wow, it was. One, four, right. six, three. Okay, yeah. good job. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> For purposes of this chapter, a government crime insurance policy or employee dishonesty insurance policy, blah, 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 may be provided as an alternative to the official bond by any county or city. And then there is another provision in another section that says that any bonding requi any uh, requirement in the government code regarding bonds can essentially re apply to any other requirement regarding bonds. So this captures okay. any bonding requirement. Thank you. Thank you. Nailed that one. You did. Wow. Do we need Let's another motion? Um, yes, we do. Yeah. We need to pass to a first. Wave title and reading and pass to a first. Um, yeah. Second reading. Yeah. Wave okay. As, as recommended with the um, <laughs> question. Ready? Correction Ready? on. Ready? Okay. okay. Motion to approve staff, re staff recommendation to approve first reading. Wave full and reading wave. and approve the first reading. And wave full as and recommended. As recommended. And language, so. approve first Thank reading. Sir. I've been told I'm required to second that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Go team. Uh, item 10E. Um, regarding a contract for emergency repairs to a storm drain off of Chittenden Lane. Oh, I thought it was ready. I bet. There we go. Bring us home, Steve. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> we need it. <laughs> Once again, we're here with another emergency repair project. Uh, this time it's a storm drain uh, located off of Chittenden Lane, which is off of Kennedy. Um, okay. I have a map here that kind of ties us in. So there's two yellow lines on the top of this map are Highway 1 um, and we have Kennedy Drive which parallels Highway 1 uh, just keep orienting you the uh, city's corporation yard is located right here Chittenden Lane is a road dead end street that <coughs> comes off of Kennedy Drive um, and services two parcels the main access f is for this 933 Chittenden property which is a commercial condominium complex um, there is access, although it's uh, an emergency access to 930 Rosedale Avenue, which is the Cabrillo Mobile Home Estates. Ken and 310 Kennedy Drive has a driveway, but their main access is actually considered off of Kennedy Drive. Um, in earlier this winter, <coughs> the uh, Homeowners Association for Brookvale Terrace, which is the uh, mobile home park located in this area down here, reported a, a lot of water coming out of the hillside um, and there's a storm drain that runs from Chittenden Lane down in through um, Brookvale Terrace and into Noble Gulch. Um, it's obvious and apparent that there was a failure in the 18 inch storm drain that came down the hill. Um, city staff has spent quite a bit of time kind of researching and coming up with repair plans for this. Um, and at this point, uh, permanent repairs to the pipe are necessary. Um, several coaches within the park are immediately downstream of a temporary ditch that has been put in place by residents of uh, Brookvale Terrace uh, and some assistance with, from the city. So um, in order to protect those coaches, uh, an emergency contract is necessary to repair the pipe. We will be replacing the entire pipe, not just fixing where it is broken, but we are replacing it from the inlet on Chittenden Lane all the way to the outlet into a V-ditch, which goes to Noble Gulch Pipe. 
Um, <coughs> our plan is uh, Anderson Pacific Contractors, who's currently working for the city on Park Avenue sidewalk and also did a previous storm drain repair project for us on Hollister uh, this year. Um, we asked them because they're, they have a lot of materials and, and forces nearby to give us a quote for the uh, repairs. They actually videotaped the pipe, um, weren't able to do the entire length of it um, due to the condition of the pipe, and they came up with an estimate of between fifty-five and $65,000 to, to do the work. Um, as you know, a lot of the, the dangerous districts or the drainage facilities to the city are kind of jointly taken care of in certain cases and it's unknown who controls them in other cases with uh, the Santa Cruz County Flood Control District Zone 5. So we've reached out to Zone 5 and asked them to help participate in the repairs. They have tentatively agreed to split the cost of the repairs, 50% of the repairs, upon approval of an agreement. And staff, city manager, city attorney, and myself and their, our counterparts with the county have been working on that agreement. We have not come to final agreement, although we do anticipate that to happen rather quickly um, in the next day or so. So our recommended action tonight is to adopt a resolution, declare an emergency authorizing procurement of services without giving notice for, once again, misspelled bids, <laughs> pursuant to the public contract code section 22050, and that would require a four-fifths vote. Approve an agreement with Anderson Pacific Engineering for repairs to the 18-inch 18, 18 storm drain at an estimated cost of $65,000 and authorize the city manager and city attorney to negotiate and enter into an agreement with Zone 5 for 50% of the cost of the repairs. That's my report. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions from the council? Yes. The diagram that you showed of the plan that connects to the ruptured pipe um, ownership uncertain for any of that? It's one of those, it's, it's not clear. Um, at this point, we're trying to partner with Zone 5 just to, to make repairs to protect the property owners. But that uh, ownership still under uh, investigation or who cares? Or it's under consideration and at this point, well, um, we are more focusing on the repairs, but it's right. something we can continue to look on. Councilmember Story. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I understand that our agreement with uh, Zone 5 is tentative. Um, if for some reason there's a stumbling block and we're not able to consummate that agreement, what's the plan B? So at this point would be to probably return to council um, the next council meeting um, if we can't get it done and uh, get authorization to um, either complete the repairs at our cost or, or come up with other options at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I appreciate that, but I want to, since it is an emergency situation there uh, and we're kind of beholden on the weather, I wonder if it'd be appropriate to call a special meeting at that, that time. That certainly be an option. And so that, I mean, it feels to me that we should maybe try to deal with that uh, as soon as possible. Um, so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll bring it to public comment. Is there any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Please do. You have been incredibly patient, sir. <laughs> Take as long as you want. Oh, man. I'm not asking. I want to turn on the timer right off. My name is Dennis Kirby. I'm a board member at Brookville Terrace, and I've been uh, working with Steve, and he's been very, very courteous and a real compliment to the uh, Public Works Department. It's been, it's been really a pleasure. He's given us all the information we needed and and um, has helped us in every way he can. Now, as far as the necessity for this, the, the, we go down, every time it rains, we go down there and watch this thing, and it's like a geyser coming up out of this ground where the pipe is buried, and um, it we've we've, took action and dug a diversionary ditch, which is working okay, but a really heavy downpour, we're gonna have a lot of water under a lot of homes. And all our homes are pit set, which is the recess into the ground, and any flooding that happens fills up those, those um, areas under the coaches. And um, it's already happened, 
when the first breakage, two of two houses, uh, the pits fill up on the room, and we had to pump it out. And it's <coughs> it's, it's pretty crucial to us that, that this happens, and we just uh, hope that you f feel the same. Right. And thank you very much. And thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further public comment? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council for a discussion and a vote. Any comments? Council Member Story. Uh, I'd just like to maybe, in order to move this thing uh, along, uh, make a motion that we adapt uh, staff recommendation uh, with the proviso that if um, staff are not able to enter into this uh, budget agreement with Zone 5, um, that they call a special meeting of the council for us to come back and then consider uh, our options at the time. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? <coughs> All right. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, sir, for being here tonight. Um, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Ben Thompson. Yeah, also. thank you. For Good being night, here still. Yeah. <laughs>